week. And Ryan Gosling looks confused. The details coming up in Pop Start today, Monday, January 15th, 2024. We are back. It's MLK Day, and this year it falls on what would have been Dr. King's 95th birthday. To honor his legacy of service this morning, we are shining a light on a couple in Alabama who started a very unique restaurant. NBC's Blaine Alexander caught up with them. Blaine, good morning. Well, guys, good morning to you. I am joining you from the King Historic District here in Atlanta. This is really the heart of the King Day celebration, but of course, his legacy is wide reaching. That includes a small town of Bruton, Alabama. That's where we found one popular restaurant that's keeping Dr. King's legacy of service alive every day. Even before the doors open, the energy at Drexel and Honeybees is buzzing. Here in Bruton, Alabama, it's one of the hottest lunch spots in town. But what you won't see, menus, prices, or a single dollar exchanging hands. This restaurant operates on donations only. Their motto is simple, we feed the need. I just wanted to do something to show people that money does not does not make the world go around. It's the brainchild of Lisa McMillan and her husband, Freddie. Together, they're serving up hot meals every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 11 to 1 p.m. A small town in southern Alabama, Bruton's population barely tops 5,000. Countywide, more than 17 percent of people are food insecure. Lisa has spent much of her life trying to change that. For more than a decade, she drove door to door delivering meals. Over 100 a day, a lot of them went to elderly people who were struggling. Everybody should have a right to be able to go in a restaurant and have a meal and not worry about paying. She shared her dream with Freddie and the two were all in. Together, they took half of their retirement fund to bring Drexel and Honeybees to life. So when you first told your friends and family about this, they thought we were crazy. People were telling us, well, how are you going to, how y'all going to open up a restaurant and people don't pay when the ones that's charged are people going out of business. Six years later, this is the daily lunch rush. They even had to recruit a little help. So if you stand back here for two hours, you're getting tired. That's just a fraction of their work. Lisa does all the shopping. How do you all decide what's on the menu? That depends on what's on sale at the grocery store. Okay. <laughs> then comes the cooking. Every meal is homemade. So this is hard work. Oh, God. It's hard work. But that work comes from a personal place. That's because years ago, Lisa was in the very same position. I was pregnant and uh, no food. When somebody was barbecuing, and um, I smelled it, and I just started crying because I, I didn't I didn't have anything to eat, and I just went I don't want anybody to go through that. That's why she pours her heart out here today. Drexel and Honeybees gets an annual grant to help keep doors open, but the bulk of the support comes from the kindness of strangers. A lot of people come here to share a story. Believe it or not, to take the hope. <laughs> we have a bunch of people that normally wouldn't socialize with each other, and now they're friends. And her customers feel it too. The meal is just like the extra. That's right. <laughs> Donation That's right. is the big part. That's right. Help the needy. The food is great. It's good. Everything is food is good here. But the real heart of the place, Lisa says, is the donation box. Tell me about these partitions here. Okay, the partitions were put up here to make sure everyone had their own little private place to come. That privacy, she says, is the only thing that keeps some customers coming back. We had to set it up 
where they could keep that pride, keep it intact. And that's what we did. Some days she finds $1,000 inside, others just a few coins, but always the handwritten notes. Thank you, uh, because of you, a family of four, eight today, we don't find a whole lot of money in there, but we find everything we need in there to keep going. And she plans to keep going for a long time to come. And every year I ask God, give me 20 more years, Lord. 20 more? 20 more years, that's right, 20 more years. These doors will never close. And she really is committed to that. She says the doors will never close at Drexel and Honeybees. And guys, believe it or not, she and her husband are still putting their own money in to make sure that the doors stay open. They say that they'll use the rest of their retirement if they need to do it. Now, that place is very special, but another special aspect are the volunteers. There are people, they say, that come from as far away as Indiana and Maine. They've heard about it on Facebook or social media, and they say they flock down there because they just want to be part of something special. Guys. Wow, wow, Blaine, thank you so much for shining a light on that. I love the guy who's like, the food is secondary, right? Yeah, it's the, the community yeah. and what a beautiful, oh. beautiful example. And her spirit is so touching. Absolutely. We should put it on our website if people want to, you know, yes. you can't be there to put the money in the Surely place. Surely there's yes. a way people yeah. can donate from a distance. We'll, we'll help that support out. that as well. Yep. Yeah. We love celebrating birthdays on the Today Show 104 for Grandma Jo. Where's she watching from? Lockhart, Texas. Is she on the phone right now? And that oh, picture of her, actually. Oh, it just went flat. 104 down in Texas, and it's surprisingly warmer here, I think, right now. Oh, there she is, Grandma Jo, looking good. Well, happy birthday to you. Oh, my gosh. Happy birthday, Grandma Jo, and everybody else on the plaza. We got a lot of birthdays out here. Still ahead for you on Popstar. Yes, we are big fans of Teddy Swims and his amazing voice. And just wait until you hear the newsman. He's putting on a Taylor Swift hit. But first, this is today on NBC. Carson left a 20 in this pocket. D, you're pulling double duty this morning. Pop start. For Love Carson. the double duty. It's a big one, too. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. We've got you covered. And we're going to start with the Critics' Choice Awards. Last night, the stars came out for the 29th annual show, honoring those who shine brightest on the big and small screens. Oppenheimer, no surprise, swept the ceremony with the most movie wins, bringing home eight trophies, including Best Picture, Ensemble Cast, and Director. Meanwhile, The Bear, Succession, and Beef dominated in the world of television, and a special award went to Indiana Jones himself, Mr. Harrison Ford, taking home a trophy for career achievement. Really happy to be here tonight to see what our business is turning into, and all of the talented people who are getting opportunities. I want to thank my lovely wife. Calista Lockhart, who, who supports me um, when I when I need a lot of support. 
And I need a lot of support. Harrison gets choked up, gets me so choked cute. up. So cute. Right? Yeah. So adorable. Congratulations to him. And when it came to speeches, moving speeches, America Ferreira had the crowd feeling all the feels with these powerful words, accepting the See Her Award. Because I grew up as a first generation Honduran American girl in love with TV, film, and theater who desperately wanted to be a part of a storytelling legacy that I could not see myself reflected in. Because of writers, directors, producers, and executives who were daring enough to rewrite outdated stories and to challenge deeply entrenched biases, I and, and some of my beloved Latina colleagues have been supremely blessed to bring to life some fierce and fantastic women. So well said. Congratulations to America. And it was a big night for Barbie. Three tunes from the soundtrack were nominated for Best Original Song. And the critic's choice is... I'm, I'm just kidding. Barbie. I'm just kidding. And look at that face. I mean, clearly goes down in the Reactions Hall of Fame, or lack thereof. The internet immediately declared Ryan Gosling winning as its new favorite me. Oh, I think funny. he's even just taking this off. Yeah, like, what's what? happening? <laughs> All right, next up, friends. Who remembers this iconic TV moment? I, Ross, take thee, Emily. Take thee, Rachel. Remember that? Well, oh. one man's trash is another man's treasure because a pair of original scripts from the season four finale of Friends that were discovered in a garbage can just sold for nearly $30,000. Wow. According to the auction website, those pages were supposed to be destroyed after filming to avoid any of the spoilers from getting out. But a former employee at the London studio found them in the trash and held on to them for the last 25 years. Wow. The former script owner said she's not even really a huge <laughs> fan, fan of Friends, but she's glad to pass the awesome memorabilia on to someone I guess they didn't have paper is. shredders back then. Right? Wow, interesting. But imagine if that got out. I mean, I mean, that would have ruined the whole thing that we all yeah. just gasped at. All right, next up, Nicole Kidman. A few years ago, the Oscar-winning actress made pop culture history with this big screen campaign for AMC theaters. Dazzling images on a huge silver screen. Sound that I can feel. Somehow, heartbreak feels good in a place like this. I need to get to the movies more. That video, which runs before movies, took the internet by storm. Fans recreating her legendary monologue, even full theaters reciting the words in unison. Now that sparkly Michael Kors jumpsuit is up for sale. It's a size two. The gray pinstripe ensemble is being auctioned off by Sotheby's and is expected to fetch somewhere between five and $10,000. That sale closes next week if you're looking for something to add to your wardrobe. Okay, Katie, yes. you mean something other than a size Yeah, I was like, I know. if you really want to suck it in, okay. <laughs> and finally, Teddy Swims, the soulful singer, recently visited the BBC Radio One Live Lounge and covered this Taylor Swift mega hit. Really good version. So yes. good. Just shows you what a great song it is. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, it's the power of the songwriting. Can Anyone it. can cover it. Team Taylor. Yeah, my daughters will be singing that his way a little bit later today. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Dylan, up next. Vicky's helping you tackle your biggest financial goals in 2024 with simple solutions to some of the most common money mistakes. But first, this is today on NBC.
We are back with our Money Saving Monday series. The new year is the perfect opportunity to reset your finances. So here to help tackle some of those common mistakes and save some money importantly along the way is NBC's Vicki Wynn. Vicki, nice to see Hi, you. Hi, great to see you. Happy New Year. So let's get through this if we can yeah. really quickly. A lot of people did a ton of holiday shopping and now they're dealing with the after effects of that. A lot of people did the pay now, buy later thing and it's having an impact. How can we help those folks? Yeah, there's this term floating around called phantom debt or shadow debt. It was coined in a recent Wells Fargo report and it really refers to all of that debt consumers are taking on through buy now, pay later plans. You've seen them. They're offered by big companies like Affirm, Klarna, Afterpay, Sezzle. And what they do is they give you a chance to pay something off interest-free in installments. But the challenge is these loans are not being reported to the credit agencies. And some estimates have them at $46 billion in mm. phantom debt that the government doesn't know about and that sometimes consumers lose track of. And all of a sudden you're trying to play catch up. You don't even right. realize how much you owe exactly. when the new year begins, it begins to pile up. Speaking of piling up, subscriptions pile up these days. And if you're not careful, you find yourself paying for all sorts sorts of streaming services and who knows whatever else right now. We are on subscription overload, Peter, and it's not just streaming services and music, razors, car washes, shampoo, laundry detergent, anything a company can get you to set and forget they want to because it's profitable. So to combat that, you really need to sit down and do an audit. Sit down with that credit card bill and go through line by line. What can you delete? What don't you need anymore? I mean, the average consumer spends $200 a month on subscriptions, according to CNR research. Is that right? That's a ton. It's a ton. It's two and a half times more than people realize they're actually spending. So look at your bills. And I know you're not an impulsive person, Peter. Careful. But for those of us who dabble in online shopping, yeah. sometimes it's helpful to delete the auto save for the credit card. If you have to go downstairs, get your wallet, manually enter that credit card number, you may be less likely to make that impulse buy. How many times do you start or your kids want to yeah. start like sign up for something and you're, you know, within 30 days you'll cancel it and you never do. You're paying $9.95 for months. Exactly. It can be hundreds of dollars that you save. Let's talk about interest rates right now. They're high, obviously. That's an impact for people who are just carrying debt and ends up just growing and growing on them. Credit card interest rates are really scary right now. They're at record highs. Forbes advisor says as of last week, the average credit card interest rate was 27%. That means for every $100 you put on your credit card that you don't pay off, you're having to pay back $127. It can be really hard to climb out of that kind of level of debt, right? So first, if you can, pick up the phone and call your credit card. Wallet Hub did a study and they found that 77% of the time when you call and say, hey, could you lower my interest rate? They do. So really? that is money on the table for you. The other thing, if you can, switch to a 0% APR card. That'll give you 12 to 18 months to get ahead on your bills, kind of try to pay down some of that debt. Lending Tree also recommends maybe taking out a personal loan. The interest rate will be lower than the rate you're paying on your credit card. Use that loan to pay down credit card uh, bills, and then that will improve your credit scores, which is huge. So let's talk about savings for individuals as well. This is a way that you cannot save money, but make money yes. in the process. Too many people have regular savings accounts, which means you're leaving money on the table. Yeah, those regular savings accounts are giving you maybe half a percent back. Last year, we talked about this. This is really the year of high yield savings accounts. So we're talking about 5% that you could be making on your money, which is simple. It's easy. That is the one upside of rising interest rates is that you can make more off of your savings. So look for those accounts. Sometimes they're online banks, sometimes they're brick and mortar banks, but a lot more are offering high yield savings accounts. So move your money there. The good thing is you can access it at any time. It's super flexible. It's not like a CD or a certificate of deposit where you sort of lock up your money for six months or a year at a time. You've got this 5% APY and it's growing your money as you speak. If you have to make a big purchase, it's perfect. Another good reminder, take advantage of the benefits that you're that you're getting from your companies as well, right? That's a yes, good way to get some money as well. that's huge. A lot of us don't take advantage of all those financial wellness options that are given to us. Certainly, we have the 401k. We always want to remind people, max that out put in as much as your company will match because that's free money. Yeah. But a lot of times uh, companies now are offering you help with your student loan management. They're giving you stipends for wellness. Like if you go to the gym, that kind of thing. And also access to free financial advisors. So when you're looking at your compensation package, look at the overall package, not just the salary number, but what are those other benefits and maximize them. Just call, just ask. The yeah. worst they can do is say, no, that's you're getting all the money we got to give you at this exactly. point. Exactly. Vicki, nice to see you. Thanks for that good yeah. advice this morning.
We are back at 850 with start today and plenty of people are focused on getting healthier in the new year, of course, and leading the charge, especially among women is strength training. It was the second most popular fitness trend of the last year. That's according to the American College of Sports Medicine and the subscription based fitness app class pass says that signups for strength training classes have increased by wait for it 94%. So here with everything that you need to know to start your journey is James McMillian. He is a NASM certified personal trainer and the director of innovation at Tone House. Well, yes. not for for any other reason. Than it. I mean, that's what Tone <laughs> that's what Tone looks like yes. right there. We like to get James, Tone. It's so Tone. nice to see you. Nice so let's walk through this a little bit. Let's talk about the strength training journey. Is so much about strength mm -hmm. is about your mindset. How do yes. you focus? What's important about mindset? So you have to start with the mindset all right what I like to tell people is progress over perfection all right technique over weight all right you have to focus on that technique and build up in your journey as well as you have to set realistic goals for yourself all right your spirit has to be stronger than this vessel when you think about training you talk okay? about it you have to be intentional with you have to goals, be intentional right? you can't just think it you have to really yes. focus a lot of people go on Instagram they like I want to try this new move and all that no you have to set a goal around your capabilities and that's what we're go into next so the luxury is in terms of capabilities we have some ladies here to be our models for the process yes, here. I yes. took my blazer off just to to <laughs> feel along with you guys okay yeah, that's, thank as, you for that's the as far as my involvement will go in this segment so a lot of this is is the roadmap and sort of figuring out where you are fitness wise yes. so help lead the way okay so setting those intentional goals you have to set short-term and long-term goals with that you have to understand your capabilities and your body so we have a strength assessment and I advise you guys to do this at home okay, okay. So the first movement we're going to go okay. right into, we have a push-up. You want to do as many reps as you can for one minute. And that push-up, you want to lead got with right your to chest. It. For real. Yes, as many as you can. <laughs> and now you have to understand if your breathing is off, if your uh, mobility, all the above range of motion in that push-up is off. Second thing we're going to go into, we're going to stand all the way up into a squat. Now <laughs> you have to have an okay. open chest, Good. shoulder width apart. You're going to go deep into that squat, rise up. Now things you want to think about is my mobility okay it's my range of motion am I'm able to stay upright okay you do that for 15 to 20 reps after that you come right back down okay. you're going into a forearm plank All so right. in that forearm plank you want to keep those hips nice and leveled if you find your body lowering or rising mm -hmm. then you know you have to adjust and work on your core okay? okay you hold that for one minute or as long as possible after that you work on flexibility and mobility they go hand in hand that with I can't, that I around. Can't do. Yes, they I go can't hand touch in my hand. toes. So, so that's we're going to think about more. touching our toes. So we're going to go down to the floor, get a nice stretch on those hamstrings. If you can't touch your toes, it's okay. That's what you have to work on. You're learning your body or your mobility. Sit in that deep squat, nice open chest. Place your hand onto the ground, raise up to the ceiling, say hello to, to the world, too. and then <laughs> you love. switch sides. Yes, yeah, so you go to the opposite side and you raise up. That's going to show you your mobility. So after you do the strength assessment, you understand understand your body, your capabilities, and then that's when you go We're into We're about to more. quickly see who works out in this group and who doesn't. We should Come make on, you Jay. do the weather. Yes. I need help. Yeah, no, I'm a little windy. All right. Mama hasn't so. picked up a resistance band in two years, okay, James? <laughs> yes, so now you know your assessment. You know your capabilities, yes. and you're understanding, yes, you want to know, okay, what weight do I use? Yeah. I will always tell clients to go from body weight, yeah. resistance bands, into dumbbells, and then into barbells. Okay, why okay? is that? So with resistance bands, yeah. it's joint friendly. Okay. Now with dumbbells, now you can work in different planes of motion as well as a little bit loaded. So what am I doing here? So right now, I you're glad, going I'm to go. You brought your workout shoes today. Yeah. That was yeah. a good Step effort. one. You're going I to want, go I into a squat. Credit with, with I'm the going heels. to utilize the dumbbell, okay? okay. okay. I'm going into a goblet squat, yeah. and you're going into a front squat okay. with resistance bands. So you're going to place your feet on the band. And do the feet need to be shoulder width apart? Yes, okay. shoulder width apart. Slightly turn those toes out okay. for the tracking of your knees. With the point of the that heels. Chest out. Okay. Point of your heels then. down. Now you're gonna grip that band, yeah. and we're gonna go into a squat, okay? I want it like uh, this kind of grip. No, no you wanna, yes, yes, you wanna grab you, it like you that. Need your help. Yeah, you okay. wanna grab like that. Okay. Elbows up. Yes. We're going down into the okay. squat. So we have three sets of eight reps at home. If you like to do it with us, there you go. Okay. All right, you go low, okay. come back up. Think about driving heels, through the like, floor. Yeah. Dri driving right. through Push. the floor yes. with the heels. With the heels, yes. Wonder Woman. All right. Okay. Great job. So we got two more reps. Two you, more. You reps. keep going. Yeah. Yeah. I'll keep going. So the next thing we're going okay. to go into yes. is a bent over roll. So I'm going to grab this other dumbbell here. Now, now you're going one. to step. 
the your foot on, on two of the bands. Okay. Yes. Okay. This is here. Stagger stance. And now the foot should be pointed out. Yes. Like foot pointed okay. forward. Okay. okay. Nice big chest. Okay. Neutral spine. Yep. Shoot your glutes towards that back okay. wall. And now we want to think about bringing our elbows towards the ceiling, pulling our shoulder blades okay. together, just like that, as if they're Last the and the smaller your back. Let's do it. All right. So now you have a chest press. Okay. Yes. I'm going to come over to the bench press. Okay. If you have a bench press at home or in your local gym. Our last game. Keep going. We're going to keep going here. Right. We are back with our third and fourth hours. Guys, there is keep more going. working out keep still going. to I was supposed here. to end this segment. I was going to make you keep going and going and going. We are more of the first your local news. A couple years ago. Well, This morning on the third hour of today, Arctic Blast. More than 100 million people waking up to bone-chilling temperatures, snow, and dangerous freezing rain. And it's only going to get colder. We're tracking all of it. Then a wild weekend to kick off NFL playoffs from huge upsets. Maryland's going to be picked off and no one in front of them. To historic wins. And Detroit for the first time in 32 years. Your Lions have won a playoff game. To that Sub-Zero showdown, and it's not over yet. We're live, breaking down all the action. And our series, Take It Off Today, one couple's incredible health transformation, how they dropped more than 100 pounds together. That's all ahead today, Monday, January 15, 2024. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third hour of today. I am Dylan here with our Weekend Today co-host, Peter Alexander, Laura Jarrett. Good yes, morning, guys. Good in the house here. It's so nice to have you here. Al Thanks. Craig and Chanel all off on this holiday morning. Today, of course, is a day to remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and reflect on his legacy. Yeah, no doubt. This is such an important day. Dr. King, of course, was born on this day in 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia. He grew up in the segregated South, would go on to devote his life to tirelessly fighting for civil rights. Dr. King was also known for his impassioned speeches, of course, including his iconic address during the March on Washington, where he shared his dream for the country's future. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Mm, still so true, even today, across the country today, is also a day of service in Dr. King's honor. Yeah, my wife taking our girls to do a community project mm -hmm. today. It's nice to notice, to, to, to use this day, mm -hmm. not as a day off from school, not as a break from the office, but as a day to really remember his legacy mm -hmm. and hopefully to pay it forward. And even explaining his legacy to our children, mm -hmm. I think just keeps, you know, Keeps, keeps it moving it forward. Yeah. 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 For sure. All right. Well, we are, of course, happy to have both of you here today. The weekend was it a good one? Weekend was good. It was a cold one, which made for a good sort of dog day of winter, if there is <laughs> such a thing. So it was me and Star oh. just chilling, watching football all weekend. Oh I'll hustle goodness. home to D.C. after our show. A little more football to watch. Star's looking so good. Needs a, needs a little cleanup. No. Yeah. Keep it like Shaggy. She she's a, she's a beauty. So, you know, after I anchor with Peter, I go try to find my children. My son James is four. He's at his ninja. <laughs> class and because mom's at work dad has to get him dressed oh my god but when i got to the ninja class i said what is that hanging down from his <laughs> shirt well james put on his sister's onesie what he looked kind of buff in it too right guys like it was like all right if he could That's fit into hilarious. it and because it was so cold we did a fair amount yes there is a onesie <laughs> the 18 month old onesie on a four-year-old yeah and and because it was so cold we did a lot of bluey this weekend we got in deep yeah for like a bunch of new episodes dropped guys you highly can't go wrong with the best Bluey. part with Bluey though is it's just as much fun for you to watch I, I mean I was laughing yeah. Tony's like, like what are you laughing at Bluey episode? so yeah. good so, <laughs> we so. uh we actually have been in a Muppets wormhole good. my kids 
are absolutely obsessed, and we've been singing the songs all weekend. This is us snuggled up on the couch watching yet another um, Muppets movie. And oh, then cuter. Calvin there, the, Calvin on the left, he clearly needs a haircut. Little shack. So oh. he finally agreed to let us get him a haircut and look at the like look at the difference here's his like shaggy kind of summertime look and oh my Adam goodness right? i can't tell if he looks older or younger but either way, I'm just happy the mop is gone. Throwing a little gel in there, too, a little smooth. I think he looks older. Older, right? Yeah, That's but still thinking. so cute. He looks so it was like fun. a young man. Finally convinced him. All right, well, it was a cold and snowy weekend across much of the country. More than 100 million people facing dangerous temperatures with record-breaking cold likely today. So let's check in with NBC's Jesse Kirsch in snowy Grand Rapids, Michigan. Jesse, do you even have a degree there? Like, even a single degree? <laughs> Unfortunately, I've been looking for one. I think we left them at home, Dylan, Peter, and Laura. Good morning to all of you guys. Um, sounds like you had a better weekend binging some TV than being out in this. Take a look at what it is outside right now in Grand Rapids. Zero degrees, roughly. That is our real temperature. Uh, but what it feels like with the wind chill is about negative 19. And it is actually, I think, snowing harder now than it was even an hour ago. This is day seven in a row of snow here in western Michigan. I met a woman over the weekend named Kim Davis, who, because of the conditions on the roads, which are definitely, you know, not the best place to be, uh, she decided to walk to the pharmacy to get some toothpaste. She said it was a 90-minute trip, uh, you know, all-in round trip, 90 minutes if you can imagine that. So that's the kind of thing people are doing just to get some toiletries right now. Uh, it's not just an issue in the Great Lakes, all of this weather. We're looking at a lot of cold weather across much of the country, anywhere from 20 to 45 degrees below average today. And take a look at the scene from Colorado. Officials say over the weekend an avalanche hit a highway there. And just to bring it back here to Grand Rapids real quick, guys, I just want to show you this is the street uh, out here. You can see it is still blanketed in snow. So definitely slick conditions for people who are on the roads. And if you're trying to catch a flight, good luck with that as well, because we are tracking uh, more than 1,500 cancellations tied to U.S. airports already today according to Flight Aware, the flight tracker. Guys, back to you. All right, Jesse, your cheeks have that nice pink rosy glow, so that's, that's a plus for you <laughs> as you stand moving, out though. there. That's yeah. the good thing. Eyebrows you get... frozen. <laughs> well done. Get warm. Thank you so much. All right, so let's take a look at the cold blast on the maps because, I mean, it is dangerously cold for so many people right in the middle of the country, stretching all the way down into Texas where it's going to be about you know 40 to 50 degrees below average. Houston will feel like 21 degrees today. Dallas will feel like five below. That wind chill is brutal all into the uh, Great Lakes. Obviously, the wind causing more lake effect snow up near Buffalo, off of Lake Ontario, too. Temperatures in the 20s going through the next several days. It looks like Wednesday in Chicago, we might get up to 17, but then Thursday we could see another reinforcement of cold air that's just going to keep this week very frigid. Yeah, be careful out there. This is, a, this is unpleasant weather, that's for sure. By the way, speaking of weather, what's better on a cold day than staying inside and watching a little bit of football? The NFL's wild card weekend was just that. It was wild, it was insane, but man, was it fun to watch. And NBC's Kaylee Hartung was on the sidelines for what was the fourth coldest game in NFL playoffs history in Kansas City. She fortunately has thawed out, is back indoors in L.A. Kaylee, good morning. Yeah, guys, it is wonderfully nice to be back indoors, and I plan on watching football from my couch, cozy as ever today. You said it, that Chiefs-Dolphins game went down in the history books, the fourth coldest game ever. This is what playoff football is all about, and there is still more to come. Detroit, for the first time in 32 years, your Lions have won a playoff game. A super wild card weekend, delivering the drama. You see a few tears in there. Detroit ending its three decades long playoff drought with a one point win over the Rams. Yeah, it means a lot. We uh, just broke a streak that's been going on for 30 years. This after the Packers pulled off a huge upset in Dallas. It's going to be picked off and no one in front of them. Reigning in the Cowboys' league leading offense holding them to just 16 points until late in the fourth. This is uh, one of my most surprises since I've been involved in sport, period. On Saturday in the AFC, a frigid face-off between the Dolphins and the Chiefs. Conditions in Kansas City, a numbing negative four degrees, taking Miami out of its element. To uh, it up, high intercepted. The temps taking a toll on Chiefs head coach Andy Reid. 
I got the answer to the question. Everybody's wondering. Yes, he does know his mustache has been frozen. <laughs> the chills spreading throughout Arrowhead, with even the drinks frozen solid. And fans in the stands feeling negative 22, including the most famous member of Chiefs Kingdom. Looks like a Taylor video. Along with Mama Kelsey, Taylor Swift cheering on boyfriend Travis, the famous couple leaving together after Kansas City's win at home. It's Rice with blocking <laughs> end zone bound. Their 26 to 7 victory keeps the Chiefs surfing toward the Super Bowl. The atmosphere here was something. Yeah, that's the Chiefs Kingdom. I mean, it, it's negative 30, whatever it is out here, and there's not an empty seat in the stands. In Houston, it's picked off. Browns quarterback Joe Flacco threw not one. Picked off again. But two pick sixes in the third quarter. The Texans advancing with a 45 to 14 win. 22 year old CJ Stroud becoming the youngest quarterback to win a playoff game. The story of Stroud is just beginning. Houston dominant. After a blizzard postponed the game in Buffalo, Bill's fans <laughs> volunteering to shovel snow in the stadium. Those Bills fans may need to bring their shovels back to Highmark Stadium. More snow is expected in Buffalo today, though the winds shouldn't be as dangerous when they take the field to play the Steelers. That's what it looked like this weekend. How wild is that? That is exactly why they postponed that game until today. And then there's rain in the forecast down in Tampa Bay for Bucks Eagles. If anybody needs any tips on staying warm, I am your girl. I got to tell you how I managed to make it through on Saturday, guys. I had eight batteries powering the layer of clothing closest to my body from my head to my toes, two pairs of socks, three pairs of pants, four layers up top, plus a big down jacket that my little brother said made me look like the Michelin man. Hey, when survival is the objective, vanity is out the window. But it was a game. I did. Oh my gosh, it absolutely did. My core temperature was great. I really did feel warm inside. The hardest part, you like that look? It's a good one. I've never gone that far before. Uh, what really killed me, though, was the fingertips. Even as big and warm looking as my heated gloves were, it was the fingertips that really, that's oh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they'll get you. I think they're still, I think they're still a little, a little cold right now. Haley, we are glad you have recovered and you are now warm There's and a, safe. The post -game Fingers interview, intact. Mahomes was like wearing not even a hat in that yeah, post-game interview. I was like, he is crazy. What is going on? Kaylee wisely bundled up to be there for four the hours. It just must warm you up. I and wouldn't know. The adrenaline pumping. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. All right, well, when we come back, shining a light on a special organization on the south side of Chicago that is spreading hope through the arts. And then later, our series, Take It Off Today, one couple shares how they work together to get healthy. We'll be right back. Finish line in yeah. style. Our <laughs> Chanel. This is for you too. I had news anchors on one wall <laughs> and you. I love this stuff. This morning we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday and tomorrow is also the National Day of Racial Healing. It's an event created seven years ago by our sponsor W.K. Kellogg Foundation. So today we are shining a light on one incredible organization. That's right guys, it is on the south side of Chicago, not far from where I grew up, called Little Black Pearl. Their mission is to heal and grow the community using the arts. On the corner of 47th and Greenwood Avenue in Chicago's Kenwood neighborhood, Set up your scene and action. There's a vibrant community center called the Little Black Pearl. That's very cool. Inside, there's an art studio and a food and wellness market. It even houses a high school. We consider ourselves a third space 
a place where people, when they're not home or when they're not at work, this is a place of belonging, a place where they get to come and have creative experiences. Monica Haslip, founder and executive director of Little Black Pearl, imagined the organization out of her home 30 years ago as a way to give back to the young people in her community. We would teach them how to create functional art, and then we would teach them how to market and sell that work. With so many talented students coming through the program, Monica says they quickly outgrew her home. And 11 years later, with the support of the larger community, she built a permanent place for the organization. We went from 2,000 square feet in my house to 42,000 square feet here, which allowed us to expand programs and do more. We do a lot of work that connects to racial healing. She says racial healing is part of almost every aspect of Little Black Pearl. If I could intentionally design something that focused on issues of segregation and separation, if I could build a business model that brought people together, could I use that to help be a bridge in a community that's changing. You can see that change in action at the Little Black Pearl Art and Design Academy, which exposes high school students to the arts and experiential learning with an emphasis on building a better community, a model the students say works. You think you want to come here and do one thing, this school makes you want to do a lot because there's so many opportunities here. I look at this school and the impact it's had on me and even other kids. Let's change the narrative for the youth. Monica says some of the graduates have come back to give back, like entrepreneur and business owner Pia Johnson, who joined the program from the beginning when she was just 11 years old. The first day that I got there, we learned how to spell entrepreneur. I was uplifted in a way that now I can give to other people. Pia continues to give back creating a program for young leaders and entrepreneurs like herself, looking to develop and grow their ideas. It's a cohort of like-minded people that have this focus on creating a community that is working together in different ways. Little Black Pearl is giving space to that, and that's what it's all about, the space. With so many different spaces, ideas, and people that are part of this community, Monica says she hopes to create more organic moments for healing, understanding, and growth. We're trying to demonstrate in our little corner of the world that we are better when we work together and when we have the opportunity to really honor everybody's humanity. Monica says she hopes the next generation of leaders spreads these lessons to communities across the country. To learn more about the National Day of Racial Healing, you can watch our streaming special sponsored by W.K. Kellogg Foundation by scanning the QR code or heading to NBCNewsNow.com. The Comcast Foundation, a branch of our parent company, is a sponsor of Little Black Girl. And I got to tell you guys, really, even where it is placed mm -hmm. jurisdictionally in the city, yeah. it is just a center of bustling wonderfulness. Like, I grew up literally five minutes away oh, wow. and uh, it has grown and grown over the years it's just one I, I love that yeah. she describes it as a place of belonging yeah. a mm -hmm. place of belonging community and growth what a great difference she's making there just ahead right here an amazing health transformation in our series take it off today how one couple lost more than 100 pounds together then later fun ways to have a ball during these snow days when your kids and you <laughs> are all stuck inside we are back with some of them after this <laughs>
Good morning, everybody. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Oh, you deserve to be celebrated. Way to go, Reynolds. Oh, Al. Al, you're all of our heroes. Yeah. Y'all love Al Roker. <laughs> We're back now with our Take It Off Today series. And this time of year, a lot of people are focused on their health. And the couple you're about to meet may inspire you to stick to your goals. Not too long ago, Ashley Evans and Brendan Roach weighed nearly 500 pounds combined. Then a dream trip gave them motivation to make a change. We are going to meet them in just a moment. But first, here's their story. Brendan and I have been married for two years. Throughout the years, we've always been active, enjoying time outdoors. But that quickly changed when the pandemic hit in 2020. We stayed home, and in the three years since, we ate a lot. For me, my weakness was grabbing a bag of chips at night before bed. Any movement for us went out the window. In early 2023, I weighed my heaviest, 260 pounds. And I weighed 225 pounds. We tried different diets, but nothing stuck. I had zero energy and always felt exhausted throughout the day. In May 2023, I won a trip to Maui, but instead of feeling excited, we felt embarrassed about how we looked. We knew we had to make a change. We started switching up our diet, eating whole foods, and saying goodbye to snacking. And to our surprise, we saw immediate results before our vacation. We eventually joined a gym where Ashley remains focused on strength training, and I've become obsessed with pickleball. In just seven months, we've lost a combined 115 pounds, and we feel better than ever. All right, guys, again, here's Ashley and Brendan before this whole health journey. And they are here, so let's meet them now. Ashley and Brendan, come on out. Hey, oh, my hi. goodness. Oh. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Hey. Hey. You look so Welcome. nice. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Oh, my goodness. Congratulations, guys. You, you, you look so amazing. Much. Oh my goodness. I'm excited to be here. Oh. Well, this is so much fun. I know you guys, like so many couples, have tried to lose weight together before. What was it about this dream vacation that really just kind of got you guys going? Yeah, well, the trip was definitely the catalyst for us to really make a change this time. And I, But I think our approach is what made the big difference. In the past, we would join a gym, try to work out like bodybuilders. In two weeks, we would burn out and we would be done. Mm -hmm. And then the same on the diet. We tried kind of the mainstream restrictive diets that would that were really hard to maintain. We would do them for two weeks and then we were done once again. So it was really hard for us to um, uh, really stick with it. Mm -hmm. But Maui got us excited. We were uh, won the trip. Then we were embarrassed, but it really set us on this this lifestyle change and we're mm -hmm. super excited where we're at today. I love that people set goals, but rarely do they follow through. You guys yep. delivered on those goals. It did require you to make some important adjustments in the ways that you eat. What were some of those adjustments? Um, yeah, so we like Brendan said, we kept things simple, so we weren't overwhelmed with anything. So when I would go into the grocery store, I decided to eliminate the middle aisles, which is where I'd find the cookies, the snacks, foods that we were so overly consuming. And I stuck to the outskirts of the grocery store where the fruits, the vegetables, the lean proteins were. And that really did the trick for me to stay focused, you know, with what food was going to come into the house. So you guys shop different. You also play different. A little pickleball. Yeah, I don't know if we have enough time for me to talk about pickleball because <laughs> oh I am very I'm obsessed at this point I think I play seven days a week and it has numerous benefits for me so it the physical benefits are it's my cardio mm -hmm. um, I I can't run on a treadmill for three hours but I can play pickleball for four or five hours mm -hmm. so it's amazing to be able to do that and then the mental health and social aspects so I'm able to get out meet new people make new friends um, and really just have fun we actually spent Christmas Day with um, my pickleball partner um, this year so it was phenomenal so we're making That's real awesome. friends and having a lot of fun. Just life changes. Yeah. Absolutely. And Ashley, I know you have type 1 diabetes. Yes. How has losing weight actually helped in that regard? It's been a tremendous benefit. I just saw my doctor earlier this month. My numbers look beautiful. My cholesterol, blood pressure, everything is down. Mm. And I've decreased my daily insulin from 50 units to 25 units. So wow. that makes me really happy and proud. Just with diet and exercise. Just with alone. diet and exercise. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's incredible. Talk about the impact. This You guys had only been married for a short time before you sort of went on this journey together, which I trust can only draw you closer. How has this impacted your relationship? Well, it's been phenomenal. So we've been together for over 10 years, married for two. And in the beginning, we 
would kind of blend our hobbies. So she would come fishing with me. I would spend time at the craft stores. And that, we kind of got away from that. Mm -hmm. um, but now we have a common goal and we have a common hobby that we're, we're both working towards. So it's, it's really been phenomenal. Um, and then I think the other piece is we really get to celebrate each other. Mm -hmm. So not only when I hit a goal, I can be happy about it. But when Ashley hits a goal and does our first pull up or loses that next 10 pounds, we can really be happy for each other. Yeah. And then an accountability partner is always helpful when yes. you're going through these kind of changes. <laughs> yes. If just one of you had done it, if you had that little cookie, it might be a little bit harder exactly. to put it yeah. down, right? Yeah. Exactly. Well, congratulations. congratulations to you guys. Yeah, yeah, we're way so to go. Thank you. Thank you. I so hope much. you can inspire someone to make small changes. Yeah. yeah. You both make small changes, be consistent, and set small goals, and you'll see big results. Pickleball two to three days a week is enough. Doesn't need to be seven days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. Just seven. a little bit. Yes. At least seven days a week. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for sharing your Thank story. Thank you all for having yeah. us. And if you want to learn more about Ashley and Brennan's story, you can just go to today.com. Up next, snow day goals, fun toys to pass the time when it's too cold for the kids to get outside. Then later in Start Today, the right way to do the most popular exercises from squats to curls. I'm going to embarrass myself again. <laughs> We're fixing common mistakes. We'll be right back. Welcome to today. Thank you so much for being with us. We're just getting started, folks. Your question's almost better than mine. <laughs> what can fans expect? Us for getting there. <laughs> Greg loves to say fry yay. There it is. Fry yay. We have already, of course, had several big winter storms, and this is the season where things can be tough. A lot of inside time. So this morning, we're going to share some fun ways to stay occupied on some of those long snow days. The Toy Insiders editor-in-chief, Ali Merjeski, is here to help us out. Ali, so nice to see you. Nice to see you, I too. I guess I'd say happy snow day, but today's not a, it may be a snow day <laughs> for some people. Happy cold day. Happy cold day, indeed, <laughs> which I guess is the same thing right now. Let's talk about some different ideas here. You can't go to the beach, per se, right now, but there are other right. things you do to build a snow castle as it were definitely so even if you're in warmer weather and not getting that snow this is the create a castle build master indoor snow castle kit so with these molds it has a patented locking this system. is my friend kensley yeah, kensley, kensley you start building for me we're gonna watch Show us you, how to okay? build up that castle <laughs> so they have these patented molds that have these locking systems on them so instead of having to flip the mold over and hope that your castle stays up you just unlock them all right and then open it up and you can peel them right off the side there you go Yep, there you oh, go. Oh, that's very nice. And you nice. get that perfect castle. This was all built with that set, so you can build it all up inside of here. You get two and a half pounds of this uh, uh, snow compound. This one was compound. for demonstrating. That's why it was taped shut. My apologies. <laughs> but that's very cool. I no, love that. Yeah, see, so they come out perfectly beautiful castles. And so Ellie is doing a little baking for us, Ellie, right? What are you baking up for us, and how does this work, Ellie? <laughs> so this is the cookies makery, and Ellie and I are going to make some uh, little plush friends, actually, here. So we're going to take, I'm just going to reach around you. Sorry about Please. that. Please. Take our little dough pals here. So this kit comes with everything that Ellie needs to mix up her little dough animal friend. We're going to stick it in the oven, close it up, turn the dial. It's going to start a timer for about 90 seconds. Okay. And when the timer goes off and we open it up inside, 
we're going to have this interactive plush pal that Whoa. pops up. So it's actually wow. scented if you want to give it a smell. It's, Ooh, they're all themed to different baking treats. Kelly, that one's for you. You want to <laughs> grab that cinnamon roll? So this is just really fun for kids. It's that baking, that cozy, comforting. Yeah, and it's right? not an easy bake oven. There's no heating going on here. Nope. It's and you can fun. do it over and over again. All right, <laughs> all right Allie, say you are got an artist in the family. Like, we got Mackenzie and Thomas here. What do you got? Yeah, so this ultimate light board from Crayola is yeah. one of my favorites, actually. So as you can see, it lights up. You can draw on it. What's really cool about this is this back panel is going to slide right out so you can trace anything on it. So we traced the Today Show logo on here for you guys. You can draw freehand. All of that it comes with these gel FX markers and our uh, light up board here. Double A batteries? What do you do here? To light yeah, this just okay. batteries. And it has storage for the markers in the back. It's got three light settings on it. Oh, very nice. Show your boards, guys. Look yeah, show how off cool your artwork. This is. <laughs> very <laughs> nice. Work, nice. Better than having like thousands of pieces of paper. Definitely all over, wipes which is clean, what my house looks like. And you do it over and over again. Okay. So it's perfect. Evan, Kyle. They can't play soccer outside, but they can do a little indoor matchup yeah. here. What do you got? <laughs> This is the Franklin Sports Battle Soccer, so they're going to battle back and forth. As you see, when they score yes. a goal, it celebrates with those lights and My sounds. My son would love this. Isn't what this awesome? What ages do you think this is so best this for? This is great for ages six and up. Okay. I mean, even up. To, I mean, I love to play with it. So adults as well okay. get the whole family involved. It's got the scoring right in here, so it's easy to use, easy to play. Who's winning, guys? I am. Oh. <laughs> it's always I am. All right, so if you, Allie, if you do brave going outside, yes. these look awesome. Aren't they? So these are our Squishmallow friends, right? Squishmallows are so popular. These are the Squishmallow snow tubes from Big Mouth. We have our three friends here. We have Winston the Owl, Fifi the Fox, and my personal favorite, Benny the Bigfoot. How cute is he? Adorable. So it's so cute. They've got these sturdy handles on them. They're durable for cold weather, so mm. they really stick up in the snow. So this is perfect for your Squishmallow friends to awesome. take them to the slopes. And if you don't want to go outside, Side and brave the snow. We've got Amanda and Alex here having an indoor snowball fight. I love these. Yeah, this, so this is one of my favorite games. This is Yeti Snow Brawl. So what they're going to do is they're going to flip cards to see how many snowballs they can stack up. The goal is to try to get to 10. See, everybody's going to get in the fun yeah. here because this oh. is really great. <laughs> if you pull the Yeti Snow Brawl, uh, card, it's an all out snow brawl. So you just okay. try to knock each other's stacks over with the snowball and you try to get to 10 first. Oh, it's getting yeah. a little bit. Dylan has an arm. <laughs> that just got these, interesting. These are also good for parents too because it gets out aggression yes. and nobody gets hurt. And nobody gets hurt. Yes. It's perfect for indoors. It's it safe to throw at each other. It's not that in that way. But yeah. Yeah. That's exactly you know. what they're like. Yeah, so they're super soft things. and super fun. We're going to have faux snowballs all over the studio today. <laughs> Allie, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, just ahead, it is start today. We are correcting some comments. And exercise mistakes to make sure you're getting the most out of your workout. Then later in Cooking with Cal, one of my family's favorite dinners on a cold night, tortilla soup. We'll be right back. <laughs> Look at the weather across the country. Now here's a peek out your window. Good morning, everybody. Shh, shh, shh. I just want quiet. <laughs> this is truly a pinch me moment right here at Fenway Park. Sweet, but I like you. Very much like your show. 
We are back now on this holiday morning weekend. Today's Peter Alexander and Laura Jarrett are with me for a start today workout for I, us this morning. I did not know this was a job requirement, but here we are. And this time we are fixing some common workout mistakes you may not even realize you're making. Here to help us is fitness expert and physician, Dr. Ian Smith. Glad to see him here. He is the best-selling author of over 20 books, including The Met Flex Diet. Hello, how are you? Thank good, you good for helping you. us. I need a lot of help. <laughs> Kayla needs no help, yeah. but I need a lot of help. Well, here's, here's the idea. For this year, I just, every year I do something different. I want to do exercises that are 15 minutes or less. So many yeah. people say, I don't have time, mm -hmm. I'm too busy. These are simple at home or in your hotel room exercises you can do. Yeah. And so I've created these 15 minute exercises you can do. So these are Ready. four groups that we're gonna do, right? The first is squats, great. Squats work on your quads, they work on your hamstrings, they work well, on your calves, and your flexion is already going. Now, People make common mistakes. For example, Kayla's gonna go down, and you see, first of all, her shoulders are too rounded. Yeah. That's not good. You want your back to be a little back, shoulders yeah. back. Secondly, for example, her knees are going in. You don't want that because that takes away from the contraction of an interior adductors. Also, it hurts your knees. And lastly, she's not going down low enough. Okay, so you want to get low. down low. So there you go. Get down low when you're sitting in a chair. Okay. And some people can actually break the chair and get down. That way you're getting full contraction of your muscles and you're doing it safely, not hurting your lower back. Feels like a knees. legally blonde, like snap back. <laughs> yeah, but you, snap can do, back. you can do this with weights or without weights or okay. with bands, okay? Okay. So this is our squats, okay? Got it. Uh, next Stop planks. Okay. Yeah, let's talk. Planks are great. Great for your core, right? But the key, Peter, with your planks is you got to make sure here. your core is engaged properly. So he's going to get down in a plank position. I'll do it. Okay. One. We're going to add something. We'll call, do a shoulder tap. Now, here's the key. People put their butt too high, which is like this. Don't want to do that. Or they go too low, mm. right? Or they put their chest down too low. So you want to be up. You want to make sure you have a nice line running down from your shoulders down to your ankles, and then you want to do uh, shoulder taps. So Peter, watch this. He's going to tap each shoulder. Off if you could just talk a little quicker, I'd be there, grateful. There you go. Okay, <laughs> shoulder tap. Go do your shoulder tap, but keep your body silent. There oh. you go. See, this way your core is engaged the entire time. If you make any, look at you, good feeling, ain't you, Peter? So if you do any of those mistakes we mentioned, you don't engage the core and you get less of a contraction, less of a workout. So that is what you call your plank with shoulder taps, okay? Right, nice talk. job, okay. Peter, you're going, you're going. You okay. Sure, Peter? Come I think on, we'll be you can right. do a little more, a little more. Okay, okay, right, so here Deb we go. we got here, who's yep. gonna do some bicep Deb curls. Deb is gonna do some bicep curls. These are great bands, by the way, if you can find chain bands because you can uh, change the resistance. Now, here's the key. People like to work on the three muscles here, their, their biceps, the brachioradialis, and the brachialis, but you have to isolate it. So, people make mistakes. The first thing you do is they go too fast, right? Mm -hmm. Deb's going too fast. Don't go too fast. Allow yourself okay. to have a contraction Control. going up and an eccentric contraction going down, so slow down. Secondly, keep your elbows tucked to your side. When you tuck your elbows, to, there you go, that okay. way we're isolating the biceps. Mm -hmm. The last mistake people make, which is really sad, is people sway at the end. So they go here and they go, oh, yeah. oh. go back. Guess why they're doing it? It's too heavy. Oh, so we know you okay. want heavier weight, so lower your weight a little bit. So look at this, you got it nice, nice and easy, isolates the biceps, keeps your form together, and this is how you're supposed to do a proper bicep. You're all like, watching I like, I like Dylan nervous. who's keeping her face like this. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ian, what's the value of the chain? Yeah, so um, these bands are great because you can actually grab them at different lengths, right? They're different oh, resistance oh, versus smart. just the handles. So um, on my website, funfitnessbros.com, okay. you can check those out right. or anywhere. Everybody's okay. doing right. lunges. Lunges, ready? Lunges. Here we go. Oh, now, <laughs> here's the key with lunges, guys. The key, a couple things. One is you want to make sure when you go down that your knee does not go forward of your toes like this. Keep you don't want me. that. So you want your knees to stay back. There you go, nice Peter, okay. The second thing is you don't want your heel to go up. This is not the proper lunge, okay, no good. So keep your front foot flat here. There you go, Dylan. And you want your back foot to be about an inch to two inches above the ground. Because sometimes you go too far mm -hmm. or you go too short and you're not doing it right. So here we go, ready? Opposite, arm up, oh. hold it, come back. Other way, <laughs> hold it. And there's your lunge. Okay, Is it better Dr. To go forward than backwards? No, both. You can do both. Does it matter? Cool. Yeah, yeah, okay. you can do both. And you don't recommend heels for this, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Okay. I like it. And you can do it with weights, with bands, without bands. And Dr. um yeah, it's, it's there is very thank simple. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Scan that QR code or head to today.com slash start today to get our newsletter and join our <laughs> online community and do better than me next time. <laughs> All right, coming up next, since we worked out, it's of course time to cook. And we're cooking with Cal this morning. We are making the perfect winter meal, a tortilla soup that'll help warm you up. We'll be right back.
It's time now for Cooking with Cal, and this dish is one of my family's favorites, especially on a cold winter night. It's a tortilla soup that's actually inspired by a Mexican restaurant my mom and I used to go to when she would visit me at Rutgers. Take a look. It's another edition of Cooking with Cal. What are we making today? Tortilla soup. Tortilla soup. I did all the hard work. I chopped the carrots, the onions, the celery, the red pepper, the garlic, but I left the zucchini for you. Always watch your fingers. Beautiful. We have to cook the chicken, okay? So look at what's in this pot. What? These are all the scraps from all the other veggies. So now I'm gonna add some water and the chicken to this pot with some salt. Why? We're gonna boil the chicken and then we're gonna shred it and it'll go perfectly in our soup. So I'm gonna just cut it into these chunks. This is what I do. So instead of just boiled chicken in water, all the celery scraps, the onion scraps, the carrot scraps, they're gonna add flavor to the chicken. Okay. Makes it taste better. Layers of flavor, Cal. Layers of flavor. Dump it right in. The whole thing. We don't want that gook that it's sitting in. I need some water. Okay, some gloves of olive oil. Wow. Now I need you to get me all the ingredients. Can I have carrots? Carrots. Okay. Onions, don't drop the bowl. It's hot. <laughs> Celery. Oh, flare, very nice, Calvin. Peppers. Okay. Zucchini. Okay. And garlic, please. <laughs> Corn, please. You have to go so high. Why? Okay. Oh, it's a rainbow. It is a rainbow. Wait, I can do it. So we're going to bring this up to a boil, then let it simmer for a little while. So while we're doing that, should we make the tortilla strips? Yes. Get one more in here. Yay! We've got our strips. My hands are But we need to fry these up a little bit, okay? Mm -hmm. And what's the one thing that's missing? Sour cream. That's a good one. Okay. I can do mine. Mmm. Mm. For these recipes and more, head to today.com slash <laughs> Okay, Dylan, I think I've almost demolished this whole bowl. Thank it's you. It's so good. I'm so glad you like it. One of my favorite parts is the way you serve it. At this restaurant, they would put the avocado yes. and the tortilla strips in the bottom of the bowl and then mm -hmm. top it with Impressed the soup. Impressed that you made your own tortilla strips, but it's also, it's not hot. Like, this is the kind of thing that's not just yeah. perfect for, like, a cold winter day, but if your kid is sick or something, yeah. something they'll it's like. a good veggie soup, really. Yeah. And you and can, you can add hot sauce if you on it. To. Yeah, if you yeah. wanted to. For I just know what to leave out for my family. Exactly. This is so good. Thank you, guys. All right, we'll be right back. Thanks to Cal. Dill, nice work.
serving. Can you feed me every day? Thanks for serving. Thanks for liking it. Makes so me happy. happy. All right, guys, tomorrow on the third hour of today, actors Lucy Hale and Matt Wolf are live in Studio 1A. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, a preview of tonight's Emmy Awards. Good day to watch some football, too. Today, fashion influencer and New York housewife Cy De Silva brings us her winter must-haves. Then we'll meet the woman inspiring kids to excel at the arts, and Donna's got a big surprise in store for them. Plus, a preview of tonight's Emmy Awards. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, it's today with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. So come on, Chanel. Come on, Chanel Jones. How are you? Welcome, everybody. Hey. It's January the 15th. You know how I know it's going to be a good day? How do you know? That was, I know it's going to be, be a good day because Chanel Jones is here. I mean. And Chanel is one of those people, and I know you guys probably watched the hour prior to this one. <laughs> Unclear if you Hi. do, but if you do, Please excellent. check it out. <laughs> this girl oh. is like a flashlight that when she shows up in a room, it brightens it up. There's no crying today. No, it happens. And there are people who are lit inside, and no matter what happens in their life, the light is there. So we're happy Special. that you're here, especially you. on this day. On this day. On Martin Luther King so Jr. So you're day. gonna make me cry, so can I say yes. something so that we don't cry? Yes, of course. Okay, so walking out with you yeah. right now, yeah. I had like a little bit of agita. Can I tell you why? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to put it out there. Mm -hmm. So I, you guys know I ran the marathon. Of course. And there was people who would hold up signs that would say, all toenails go to heaven. And so <laughs> I was so afraid that my toenails were going to go to heaven. <laughs> By the way, when you run a lot, they do fall right. off. Right. But mine are just a little bruised. Okay. And so this is the first time I've worn these shoes because they're delightful. Ooh. But walking with you just a second ago. Yeah. Oh. Like, I kind of feel them. It kind of feel hurts. like your toenails? <laughs> That was not so, where I thought that was going. No. I so I'm so okay. happy that we're sitting now. Okay. By the way, just for one second, when you said the marathon, I just had a very strong, strong memory of standing with your entire family. You were with all family, of them. Yeah. Your Today Show family with signs and cheering and watching you do what you did. And I still remember you put, I saw your kids scream in delight, Clara especially. They almost wanted to run over and tackle you. And one by one, everyone had that same look. It's like our girl. Mm. Thank you. I tried to make our this girl. not cry by telling you my toenails are bruised, and then you go back. To no, me. but I. Yeah, but I just think that was such Thank a you. that there are defining moments in life where your kids. I, my mom ran a marathon when she was sixty, mm. and I remember watching her, mm -hmm. and I remember the finish line, and I remember running up the hill at the Iwo Jima Memorial, and I remember that I from that day forward, I always thought to myself. If she could do that, I could mm. do this. So whatever you taught yourself, excellent. But what you Thank taught those you. kids of yours, those cute kids. You got Thank cute, you. you got cute that was kids. my that yep. was my hope. And you know, for me, mm -hmm. that was the first time where my world my worlds came together. You mm -hmm. know, when you get married and mm -hmm. you, you've got like your college friends, yeah. your work mm -hmm. friends, mm -hmm. your that was my wedding. To have you on my corner and Dylan and Savannah and mm -hmm. then Kine's first babysitter from Philly. Yes. His in-laws from Nigeria to Chicago to here. Yes. Like it was all Everybody was there. on one corner. Yeah. So anyway, but here we corner. are and toenails are fine because we're sitting. Good. So, all, all right. right. What are we going to talk about today? Uh, MLK Day is a great day of service, so we just want to shout out Absolutely. everybody. Absolutely. Take a minute. We're, we're telling this to ourselves, too. Sometimes but even we, just to do something for yeah. someone else, it doesn't have to be, sure, paint a home or do something bigger. Yeah. Sometimes what Hoda just did for me, you can do that for someone mm. else. You're sweet. Yeah. Sweet girl. Today. By the way, she makes beautiful kids. Uh, Your children are stunning. Yep, beautiful mutual. kids. All right, so there is a Bustle article that we saw, mm -hmm. and it's it's entitled this, An Ode to the Corner Store, My that. Third Place. I thought that's kind of interesting. The writer is really kind of paying homage to just, mm -hmm. a, just a corner store, mm -hmm. a deli, a bodega, whatever superette was on your corner. Mm, do you have one? Um, you know what's funny? I was just remembering, I grew up in Morgantown, West Virginia. Okay. And I have 
Three memories of Morgantown. My address. What's there now? Uh, still the house, same somebody house. There. Mm -hmm. Somebody lives in there. Uh, my phone number. I remember it because we had to remember our home numbers. You remember yours too. Yeah. Do you all remember your home, your first, your yes. first number? Isn't but it weird? That is so we true. We all Oda. remember, and I remember because you had to know it because when you were at a friend, there weren't a million numbers. You only had to know one. And the third thing I remember is there was a store called Harry Superette. And it was, you went down this big hill and there was a tiny store that all the kids loved because there was some candy and then there were all the stuff. But it was so part of my growing up that I remember, can we go to Harry's after school? Can we stop at Harry's? And my parents would say yes sometimes and no so sometimes. So it's like Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Yes. It was like part yes. of your village. It was part of our little village. That's yeah. cool. What about now? Now there are bodegas on the corner where yeah. I know the guy. You know, yeah. it's like you yeah. know the guy, you know the person. Yeah. And when I first moved to New York, I remember my mom came and I said, "It's too big here. I don't know anybody. It's too big, too big." And uh, there's a you know big buildings, thousand people in your building, uh, a CVS nearby. You, you didn't know anybody. Right. My mom was there for I don't know three four days. When she was done, she was like, oh, did you see Mohammed at the bodega? He knows my coffee. Hello. And he would hand my, hi, Sammy. I go, how do you, how'd you know him? She knew all the people. She made a community before she left, which was setting the table. She's running marathon at 60 and yeah. making community. Yes, New York making City. community. That is, she's quite the rock star. Yeah. Did she? you have any of those little um, tiny stores? Yes. And even now in the city, it's become, I call it West River Drive. What's it called? Where's Rainy? Riverside. Riverside, Riverside Drive. Drive is my third place. Okay. It's like you have your work, you have home, but that place is kind of, it's it's mine. It's where I run. It's where I go. I, I think uh, over there. I love Riverside Drive. I can sit Drive. over there. It's just, it speaks to me. Different buildings. It's your little I just, spot. It's just for you. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you need that place. I like that. Yeah. I like All right. That. Okay. So here's a story that's kind of weird and catching a lot of attention. Okay. And it's going to resonate with a lot of people, I think. So this man opened up about a dating dilemma. So we started dating this girl, and okay. they were dating for a few weeks. Yes. Um, and they're in their late 30s. They've been dating for a while. And the guy says that recently his girlfriend has developed a habit. She's using a baby voice when they're alone <laughs> together. When I heard the producer say this, I thought, why? Hi, Sam, come here, baby. Can you do? Can you come here? Can you do? Can you? Why do you? Why? Why are you doing that? <laughs> the guy says he can't take it. He doesn't know if he can take it. Did you ever use that? What? You probably. You I will, will say. say oh, okay. No, no. Okay. When I, okay. okay no, this is kind of different. When I got married, I had Lily Debbie Allen. She's my cabbage patch. Yeah. On my bed. Okay, that's. And. Grandma said I had to get rid of the cabbage patch. <laughs> okay, that part of your childhood. But, but she, have you she's ever always done, been with me. Please, can you please? Absolutely not. Maybe we don't one even time. do like no. Never. I don't even. You know how people say like boo or bee you or what's call, that? Yeah, you don't call him anything other than his name. Mm -mm. Do you say honey? Mm -mm. Wait, you just call him by his name? No, I'm trying. We're trying to be better at that. Like I'm not <laughs> a like PDA. You're not a PDA person? Mm -mm. Hold hands outside. No, it drives everybody in my family crazy. Like my grandmother just the other day, she was like, you know. Make Old sure you sh yeah, Old like they, I just, I, we're just not. Did you, were you exposed to PDA when you were a little? No. Or, okay. I think, I, sometimes you either do what they did what, or so you do the you, opposite. Are you, were you a my, You know, it's funny, my, I, I wasn't and am not, but my parents, if photographs tell the story, you know how you like, you don't really remember it, but They're then kissing all over the they're place? They're like hugging and my mom's on my dad. I still remember the day my mom like jumped on my dad's lap and we were all like horrified oh, that it was yeah. happening in front of us. Oh, wow. But it does teach, because you do teach your kids like, like emotion, it's yeah, okay. And this is, love can look like this, mm. and it's okay. You're like, no, I'm, I'm trying to picture you on a corner somewhere, like kissing some guy. <laughs> Would you be like, I'm in love, it doesn't matter. Uh, you've done it. You've done No, all there's a, no, no. One time my whole life have I kissed a guy in public, and it was, I broke up with Uche in college, and I was like, I don't need ha -ha. him, ha ha. And we're at some random place in Chicago. And you made out with a stranger? Some guy. And that was I the found out time? he was like some, that was show. the whole time? That was the whole time? I had to stop myself. <laughs> The whole time. Wow. But so you were that Every, girl? I, well, I, no, I just have because sometimes you're just lost in the moment. You can't believe that it's happening. Really? You're in, like yes. where? At a furniture store on a street corner. What? Yes. You guys are welcome for all this information I'm giving America that Cole is in a furniture store because he's a man. Yeah. And you know him too. Okay. So, oh. so I'll fill you in later. What to start with? <laughs> no, I'm not telling you any initials. Like in New York? You know him, yeah, you know him. Okay, so there is, guys, a viral hot chocolate that is taking New York City by storm. So local tourists, so excited. People are lining up okay. for hours to get this cup of cocoa. Have you seen it? 
I've seen, it's I have not seen it. Oh my gosh. I'm so they excited. They are called, how do we pronounce it? Gloss. 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 Are you from Gloss? I'm, I'm the owner of Gloss. Sasha. Are you the owner? Yeah. I'm filling Sa in for Jenna Bush Hager and I'm, listen. Oh my gosh. I'm so honored. So, <laughs> Sasha, you're here. Yeah. These are, you guys, how did, first of all, how did this come to be? This is amazing. And tell us what it is exactly. Right, so we have two different hot chocolates. The one okay. on the left is our new flavor that we're making just for you. Which one? The one with the cookie the in cookie. it? It's a okay. salted chocolate this. chip cookie s'mores. Okay. And Fine. then our other classic, this is oh. our first flavor, is our classic so, s'mores. So how do you, so tell us how you made this. So you, there, there's marshmallow around the rim. Tell so, us about it. Yeah, it's a house-made marshmallow meringue oh, hybrid gosh. recipe that we developed that gets piped around the rim, oh my gosh. rim and then torched, and then a, a little bit of fresh whipped cream on top that we make. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hold on. I saved this on my Instagram. Uh, yeah. I made you turn pink. I yeah. saved this on my Instagram. And when they told me that you were coming today, you're excited. Wait a minute. I get why people wait and wait and wait. It looks really good. Mm. It's so delicious. Mm. It really tastes Isn't that so funny? Good. You made a s'more kind of thing on the outside. Oh, this Wait is. a minute and wait. This one you made especially for us because you added the cookie? Yes. Okay. Mm. Two, two cookies. So mm. a cookie ring around the wait, outside look. and then a dipper on top. Look, look, look. Look what he did. Look what they did. What did they do? Cookie on the top. Oh, you're gonna? Or are you gonna just? I, I don't know. I'm, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. <laughs> There's so much spoon, happening. Yeah. What do you do? Scoop a it in. Spoon and a and a straw. Spoon kind of. and a straw. Yeah. Oh my gosh, these are hot. And the cookie is gluten free as well, actually. By the way, of course, it's gluten free. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you do, are you guys are your your Zaybars too, right? Yeah. Well, my family, yes. Zaybars okay. is a, an awesome, awesome, awesome spot in New York City. Anyone who has come to New York City has gone there. Yeah. You've created something, um, a masterpiece, Sasha. Thank you so much. I can't believe you came here. Now the line's going to be twice. Congratulations. <laughs> this is all over my Instagram mm. feed. It's been, it's been wonderful. Mm. It's been a Thank Christmas you, Sasha. Miracle. Yay. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, guys. We appreciate it. All right, coming up next. Your friend likes your outfit and wants to buy it. Is it okay to tell her where you got it from? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. That's, oh, oh, is this girl code girl time? Girl code. Mm -hmm. After this. Mm. Y'all, that's... Try the cookie off the top of the room down right now. Just take a bite of that cookie. Just that. Oh, this is not. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back, here we go. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. Happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. It's time to help out our fellow females in a segment we like to call Girl Code. Girl Code. All right, first up. <laughs> my friend recently complimented me on a dress I wore and asked me where I got it from. I'm flattered, but I also don't want her to own the same dress. Am I breaking girl code if I tell her I can't remember? We are so not like that around here, are we? Yeah, you're breaking girl code. You're breaking it. You can't. Tell her where you got your dress. There's enough food <laughs> for everyone. I think, I think there is a weird, I've, I've never understood this, but it seems like it's a theme. Yeah. But whenever, like, whenever I've gone to an event and someone says, oh my gosh, we're wearing the same dress, I don't care. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't. No, I'm not and like, I believe that. But I'm not of, like, we both. Of course yeah, you're not did. running into change. No, but but I don't. I still don't understand why two people don't have the same taste who wind up at the same event with a dress that's the same. That's a really. I don't know. I can't explain that. I understand why people mm -hmm. feel horrified. They want to feel like they found something unique. exclusive right. and unique. Right, right. And this you don't need that me. affirmation. So no, you're no, like, I don't, I don't care about well, I'm happy you're wearing so it. So would you tell, you would say, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And also it's going to look different on you or you say, you know what, now I got this one. So you have to get blue. Yeah. I'll yeah. wear green and then we'll be twins. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So if you don't want them to wear the exact same thing, okay. but 
Be a giver because it comes back yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. All right. You want me to okay. read the next yes, one? Yes, please. Okay. My friend just started teaching classes at my gym. I love my usual coach. Do I have to switch over to her class now? Oh, so she's teaching? She's teaching. Oh, that's awkward. I'm not sure what you do there. I know, because I don't think I want to go to that class. No. I think I want to stay in my class. <laughs> I like my class. I like my class. I think I would say, <clears throat> you know I love you a lot. However, for this one hour, I've sort of gotten in this rhythm with this other class, and I really love it. I'll take yours occasionally, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay That's where it. I am. Just say you love them, because I think part of it is they feel in a front like, wait, you don't think I'm that good at what I do? Mm -hmm. I thought we were friends. This is my passion. Don't you want to share in it? But I think you can say. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I think if you, you're just honest. Yeah. <clears throat> and also, she still gets a break. You get a break. Like. Right. And let's, why don't we plan coffee after so we can do a catch up. I you know, that. something. Okay. You're good at these things. Here's the last one. Okay. My friend just came over to my new place for the first time. I asked her if she wanted a tour and she said, nah, I already zillowed it. Am I right to be offended? Yeah. You can be offended on that. And then I don't know if you're coming back. <laughs> Wait, I already zillowed don't it? Don't do that. Are you kidding me? That's something you should keep to how yourself. About the, how about the time your friend tells you the same story for the third time, you just listen to it because you just go, okay, she loves this story a lot. I'm going <laughs> to yeah. hear it one more time. You, you definitely should, I think the idea that your friend zillowed it is telling you more about your friend. They're not really friend. She's not really a friend. No, because it's not about <clears throat> what it is. It's about your take on it, like yeah. this is where I think I'm gonna have my ex, or this is where this is gonna happen, or this yeah. is where or my kids are Or you say, gonna... you know what, this house is so amazing, I zillowed it, but I can't even imagine what you're yes, gonna do inside Yes, that's of it. Because, I mean, it. if that's a house, but you, I'm sure, are gonna put something, I like right? that. Woo, these, okay. Girl, if you Those got a girl good. code question, tell us all about it. Go to hodenjenna.com and hit the connect button. All right, up next, style star Saida Silva shows us the winter looks she's loving right now. Maybe we can rock them mm -hmm. too, after this. Celebrating our girl Jenna Bush Hager. Go read me. It's so good. Are y'all still happy your daddy's home? Yes. There's Jenna. She's not afraid to be herself. <laughs> love you, Jenna. I love you. I love you. I love you. Cast to help us freshen up our winter wardrobes. Hi. Hello, ladies. So nice to have you. Yeah, so wait so a minute. Happy to be back. Are we still loving the Real Housewives? What's happening there? Um, I am. I'm still loving my brand new five extra friends that I, that, I, <laughs> that I have now, my extra buddies. We're going to lunch tomorrow, actually. Oh. Are they, have they turned into real extra friends? Yes. Uh, some of them more than others. Yeah. But, you know, they're still, they're my they're my girls. Okay, and you're okay. enjoying it still. Yes, so I So you're am. saying is, we're, we, okay, you don't have to tell us, but you're Stay enjoying tuned. it. You're enjoying Stay tuned. It. Stay tuned. Okay, shall we talk fashion? Yeah. I would love I like, to talk I like fashion. Your satin, satin is really having a yes, moment, Yes, right? it is. Let me stand up. Let's satin see. is having a huge that moment. That looks so cute. And you know what? I paired it with just like an oversized white shirt. Yeah. Even if you have a husband, a boyfriend, take it from them. It I love you make it look style. so chic. I know. Thank I don't you. think it would look a like a t-shirt and a satin skirt. Okay. okay. You know what? I'm gonna have to come over come and I'm over. Gonna dress yes. you up. Just and she has it. legs like you do, so you guys can make it one side. Let's make Let's it happen. Okay. So I, we want to do another look or three trends. Let's do one trend. What's our first trend? Okay. What is our first trend? I have some models here today that we're going to show off our first trend, and this is the knit 
dress. I it's feel like cute. it's winter, turtlenecks like are that. still going. Um, knit dresses are very comfortable, but yet very versatile. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And you can also layer them up. I love that we layered this up with an oversized coat. Oversized coats are also having a really big really? moment right now. I don't know if it's just me. I, I'm always shopping no, for I'm vintage clothes. No, I noticed you were. I told her I stocked her on her Instagram page. You wear a lot of great. oversized. What's the difference between like oversized and then it just looks like too big and not stylish? Yeah. Um, I think you can feel it. I think okay. once you start looking a little like you're getting lost and the jacket is wearing you yeah, versus you wearing much. it, that is a telltale sign. But she looks that. fantastic. The price point of this dress is really great. And it's also something that you can kind of wear in tonight as well. Mocha, nice job. You, Mocha. All right, let's bring out our rainy. The off the shoulder is back. Yes, off the shoulder is definitely back. I'm doing two different combinations oh. here. Now we've seen off the shoulder in several different fashion shows over the years, but now it is really making a big comeback. I love, again, another knit so dress. Cute. But now we have a version that is off the shoulder. It feels really good. Like, let's show off those clavicles. Mm -hmm. Why not? Okay, I feel like it's, it's flattering. I feel like you it's said that a long time like ago, it. that it's a flattering. Yeah, certain cuts are flattering on most people, and that's yeah. one of them. I think it looks great on both of them. And then on this, uh, yeah. Kavita, Kavita looks so cute. we are doing more of just the top area. So it still looks very polished. It looks elegant. It's classy. And you can go ahead and put your hair back. And if you would really like, cute. you know, just layer the necklaces as Rainy did. I really like that. And then also maybe statement jewelry. Silver jewelry is really coming back in style. Silver? Mm. Silver, okay. yes. I mean, I'm a gold girl, I so I'm say, like, yeah. I have to kind of replenish and get <laughs> other things. But okay. both of them look fantastic. We love I love it. it. I love it. Yes. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. All right. Now, pinstripes. Are having a moment. I love Cute pinstripes. Cute as can be, Victoria. Pinstripes exude this beautiful, classic, elegant um, silhouette, except we're doing a twist to this. Okay. This is going to be more of the girl on the run. Ah. She can go for coffee because we're mixing it with the dad sneakers. Don't throw away the dad sneakers. What do you mean dad, define dad sneakers? Okay, the dad sneaker is something that you would see a dad okay. wear. Okay, they're chunkier sneakers. <laughs> and you know what? We're making them cute. Okay. We're making them look good. You I can wear it. them so many different ways. Women are also wearing them with dresses. And you know what? With the ice chunky cream shoes? socks. The dad shoes? Yes. Ice cream socks. Remember the ice cream socks? The slouch The squiggle? The, yes, the slouch socks. What? I'm sorry, exactly but those with the different colors. That Those is so are my cute. <laughs> yes. okay. But this Sneakers. looks fantastic on Victoria, and you can also mix and match. I love this piece so much because the jacket you can wear with jeans, and then the trousers you can also do with a blazer, and again, a jacket or even a, a trench coat in the spring. Love it. I love Let's it. Bring all of our models out. Effortless to one last and look. I like Come this on, time because these are looks that we can all do. Yes. Right? These are doable. The knit skirt. The or well, the I'm, I'm coming over to, to Hoda's, and I'm going to put coming over? this off the shoulder. I can't wait and to Satin. Girl, you're gonna you're gonna see my closet. Satin skirt. Gonna, you will. You'll do it. Okay. No, I'll bring some Done. clothes. Okay, you'll bring them. Great. Okay. By the way, this this also looks very day to night for a lot of the of looks. Looks beautiful. All right, okay, you yes. can catch Sai, of course, on the Real Housewives of New York, our sister network, Bravo, and also streaming on Peacock. Sai, thank, thank you. you. Thank we you, love you. All right, up next, feel good comfort food. Chef Jannar Wells shows us his mama's chicken pot pie after this.
welcome to the third hour of today. Yes. We're so proud of you. Cross that finish line in yeah. style. Our <laughs> Chanel. This is for you, too. I had news anchors on one wall <laughs> and you. I love this stuff. When it's cold outside, we crave warm comfort food, and nothing hits the spot like chicken pot pie. Oh, that just sounds good when you say it. <laughs> Chanel Chef Gernard Wells is a cookbook author, host of the popular show. It's called New Soul Kitchen. It's on Clio TV. And you're here today because you're about to share your mama's homemade recipe. This is big that you're revealing you're this sharing. for us. And the QR code, of course, is right there on the screen for ingredients and the rest. How are you? I am good. Happy New Year's, Happy guys. New Year. It is so good to be back. But yes, this is my mother's signature pot pie recipe mm. um, that I highlight out of my cookbook. And one of the things I love saying about this book, it gives you all of the vegetables. So, you know, we got us some nice good carrots. Mm -hmm. I always say you dice them. A lot of people wonder... How do you dice a good carrot? Yeah, First, do. you slice it down the center, lay it on the side. You can cut it on again. The flat side, or right? you can just line them up and pop, 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 pop. pop, pop. pop. There you go. That's simple. Yes. Yeah. yes. Then from there, it's all about the fillings. We got okay. potatoes, we got green onions, we got sweet peas, we got carrots, all of those. Is that you, celery at there? Yes, it celery is. Too. Flavor okay. on top of flavor with garlic. Okay. So this goes right into our pot over our chicken here. Okay. You're right. See, see you caught that one right there. Yes, yes. So in Cajun seasoning. Now, oh, first you want. Wait, what now? Cajun, Cajun seasoning. seasoning. Good. Now, you know I'm a southern boy okay, growing up. Little, I gotta go ahead and add the peas in there. Yes, okay, yes. Okay. Now, when you saute your chicken down, you got that flavor from the chicken. You add those vegetables. So you kind of cook the chicken down a little bit before you throw the veg in? Yes, you do. You do. Yeah. And then this is the thing I always say people love shortcutting their home. Yeah. If you don't want to go to cooking your chicken, go to your local grocery store. Find chicken that's already cooked, got the oh, flavors. Just pull it, up. it, add your vegetables. Okay, so everything. now what okay. are we adding? Now it's about the roux. We got the chicken roux. stock. We got chick. Oh, we got chicken down. stock. You want to add that in. But now okay. for your roux, eat, go ahead and add it What's in. What's in there right now? Equal parts flour and butter. Flour and butter. Yes. Flour and you know, butter. a lot of people, depending on where you're from, you'll call it a roux or you may call it a grain. No. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes. On. Then grab me a little of that heavy cream there. Heavy. Uh -huh. Let's get it in. We're making magic uh -huh. here. That's and why when I would so watch good. my mom in the kitchen making this, it was it was like heaven, especially walking in. Yes. You smell it. Add a little kosher salt, cracked black pepper, okay. green onions. We want to get all of What's this that? in. It's all, yes, it is. All of this. What's flavor. that last little piece? Look, look at this. You, you know that? what that I is? Know. Rosemary. Oh, look I love that. rosemary. Yeah, let your nose talk to you uh, in the kitchen. Let That's your nose talk to me. I'm and once you blend to it together, too. you start getting getting this right so here. It's thick. It, it should be yes, thick. Yes, thick. Because see, we know what's important with a good pot pie. What? The creaminess, the feel. But see, you're talking about crust, so they go go together hand in hand. You've already poured that in there. Yep. What what you do is once you get everything together, this. you got your My chicken, gosh. you got your pot. So you you fill up these you guys. You fill up your ramen because you can do ramen, you can do bowls, whichever oh, you like delicious. here. Then puff pastry. Oh. Is that or just like you can, you can get that in like a, just in the refrigerated section? Yes, it's done about done. saving time. I want to add more value yes. to your life. I say you should eat good. And have I like time these to. individual And you can guys. take you a nice good fork, do the indentions around the sides to make uh -huh. it stick. Make, or oh my goodness. Then look, to let it breathe, because okay. you don't want it to just bubble Explode. over. Boom, 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 little, little slits. Or as my mother would do, she would be yes. funny with it. She would actually cut and make some J's in it. <laughs> She's like, Janard, that's just for you. Now, oh my how gosh. long do you cook it? These right here, you want to cook for roughly about 20 minutes, because remember, everything is done. Your chicken is done, oh, your sure. vegetables so is done. Just, just so you're just browning and making it merry oh, to come like together. I can make a big one, too. If I know, right? For yeah. the family, and that's yeah. how I look. I come from a big family, it so is, yeah. it was all about saving Delicious. time and money oh, at the same pie. time, giving you that love. And it was almost like a big hug. Go ahead and get into oh, it. Know, I'm gonna get into Delicious. It. Yes. Now look. Tell us about this berry salad. Berry salad. I always say with a good pot pie or any savory dish, you want to have that greenery. And me, okay. growing up on a farm. Look at that. Look mm. at that. See, that's what that's what that's Gnard. what you want. Gennard. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Mm, thank you, John. So, girl, growing up in the South, it's always important, as I say, to have nice greenery to balance everything. Because right. we've got a lot of vegetation. Yeah. So, making our oil, you got honey. Mm. Oh, you make you it? Got, you got olive oil, or you can use avocado oil. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also, you can substitute your honey for agave, depending on. on what sweetener you want and here. And a little balsamic? A little balsamic in there to bring it together. Whisk Boom, that up. whisk it together. And now we're making our salad dressing. Okay. See, that smells salad so dressings, good. It's not hard. No. You know, a lot of people get intimidated. Yeah. 
Cooking is your friend. It's that zen moment. And what I like doing, we take these fresh vegetables. Okay. Come on in here. We got, we got our arugula. Yes. That arugula gives you that nice peppery feel. Mm -hmm. We got our berries here, our strawberries. All of these you can get at Yummy. any given time. What kind of cheese you, do you like to use? Oh, this right here, I love a good mozzarella. Mm. mozzarella. Nice, fresh, light, mm. delicate. You want to just bring it in. Mm. You this add your delicious. walnuts. Gennard, the walnuts add something special. It I, adds Karen to like me. You got to oh. coordinate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Delicious. Get this recipe. Yummy. Delicious. Thank, thank you, Janard. Thank you so Go much. Go to today.com slash food. All right. Up next, how one woman is bringing the arts to kids in her community. And Donna has a big surprise in store after this. What time is oh, it now? Right. Best time of the morning. Right. That is pop star. Yes. I want you. Pink is it now? And I miss you so much. Yes, They're delicious. Bam! Carson. This is a decision 2024 election alert. Here is Lester Holt. And good evening from New York, everyone. NBC News can now project Donald Trump will win the Iowa Republican presidential caucuses. The race for second place is still too early to call. Let me bring in Kristen Welker, moderator of Meet the Press. I know you've been watching very carefully the margins in this race. What might that tell us? Lester, the margins are hugely important here. We are going to watch and see if former President Trump can get over 50%. Why is that important? It would match all of the polling. It would give him huge momentum heading into New Hampshire. It's still early, but he's got a strong lead. And there's still drama this evening as we look at number two. That's right. The race for second place, it's all about that right now, Lester. Governor Ron DeSantis, for him, it is mission critical. It's going to be tough for him to justify staying in this race if he doesn't come in second place in Iowa. He's focused so much on that state. For Nikki Haley, she wants to come in second so that she has momentum heading into New Hampshire, where she is within striking distance of Mr. Trump, trailing him by only a few points. You've been pouring through a lot of data. What does it tell you about who came out for Trump tonight? According to these entrance polls, Lester, evangelicals. He trounced in that uh, group. We expected that, but now we're seeing that that has come to pass. Non-college educated voters, and by the way, two-thirds of caucus voters say that he would still be fit to serve even if he were convicted of a crime. All right, Lester. Kristen Walker, thanks very much for continuing coverage of more Iowa caucus results. Head over to our streaming network, NBC News Now. For now, I'm Lester Holt in New York. Good night was the solution. It not only mentors students who want to pursue the arts, it offers lessons in visual arts, dance, music, and stage production, as well as an outreach program in public schools, touching the lives of as many as 22,000 students over the past 24 years.
once they hit that stage, you just literally see their face and it's a whole, they're, they're different kids literally in three months. Contessa's passion has reached beyond Milwaukee with the success of her former students. Like T-Bay alum and professional dancer Josie Thompson, who has performed alongside stars like Doja Cat. And Donna Lewis, who joined T-Bay as a kid and recently returned to teach a new generation of artists. Being in this room, what kind of memories come up? Uh, I've been trying to like pinpoint the exact words, but the culture here is, is so um, warm and everyone supports each other in their endeavors. What is your biggest hope for the kids here? To leave knowing that what they're doing is aligned with their passions and purpose. Whatever they're doing, they are proud. That same purpose, passion, and creativity carries on at T-Bay. There'll be serious times where, you know, we gotta push it, but then at the end of the day, that whole day, we sit down, we talk, we have fun. It's more like a family than just T-Bay. To support the mission, we had a big surprise waiting for Contessa. A lot of people have heard about your story. Wells Fargo told us that they were inspired by T-Bay Art Center and how committed you are to putting communities and people first. So we have a little surprise for you. Wells Fargo is donating $5,000 to T-Bay Art Center. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank y'all. Thank y'all so much. We love T-Bay. What a great story. Oh, love that, love Thank that. You, Donna. Up next, which of your favorite TV shows and actors will win big tonight? We have your Emmys preview after this. Look at the weather across the country. Now here's a peek out your window. I just want quiet. <laughs> this is truly a pinch me moment right here at Fenway Park. Sweet, but I like you. Very much like yourself. After months of waiting, the Primetime <laughs> Emmy Awards are finally happening tonight. Here with a preview of what to expect is New York Live Entertainment correspondent Joelle Garzullo. Hi, ladies. We've been, waiting. We've been waiting for these Emmys, right? So yeah. what happened? Okay, I feel Where like they everyone's like, the Emmys? The yeah. Emmys are here? So these are last year's Emmy Awards. Voting closed at the end of August. The award show was supposed to take place in September, but remember the strikes Strike. that we had. Uh. So I like to say those metaphorical envelopes have been sitting there okay. sealed for four months, but the show goes on. Well, Somebody's Tonight. It's time for them to get their due. Yes. Right? So yes. Yes. Who's hosting? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm very excited about this. <laughs> Secretly because I'm like, okay, well, Anthony Anderson is hosting. I should I say that. Him. But anytime I think of Anthony Anderson, I think of Tracy Ellis Ross, who yeah. I know is like one yeah. of our favorites, so yeah. I hope she'll be there too. But oh, I think he good. is an excellent pick for yes. host. Um, he released a statement, and I think this is going to kind of tell us about okay. his style. He said, with our industry's recent challenges behind us, we can get back to doing what we love, dressing up and honoring ourselves. And <laughs> yeah. make so I feel fun. like it's like that's the vibe that good. we could yeah. expect yeah. going he's into got, the night. that fun show with yeah. his mom good. too, so he's been, yeah. having, he's been having fun. All right, so we can't get to every single category, but let's break down some of them. Okay. Um, 
do you expect, first of all, a headline, a big winner? A succession. Night? Succession. So yeah. going okay. into the yeah. award show, Succession leads the pack with okay. 27 nominations. Goodness this is the gracious. show that everybody's talking about. And you know what? It's up for the coveted award of the night, Best Drama Series. Okay. It, yeah. It's going to take it. What no about drama the, there. We're looking at some lead actors that we've got on our big board oh, there. Well, this is a, this looks okay. very competitive. I'm so happy that you're bringing okay. up the lead actors in Who the drama think? series. And here's why. So this category, it's very special this year. It's made Emmy history. We have three actors from Succession, right. all up for lead. So wow. we've got Brian Cox, mm -hmm. Kieran Culkin, Jeremy Strong. They're going to be going up against Pedro Pascal for mm -hmm. The Last of Us, Jeff Bridges for The Old Man, and Bob Odenkirk wow. for Better oh. Call Saul. This is now, a good, this is a, this great, is a great category. category. Now, yeah. Kieran Culkin is favored to win. He just okay. took home the Golden Globe. Gavin and I were texting about this going back mm -hmm. and forth. If there is an upset, expect that to come from Bob Odenkirk for Better Call Saul. Oh. This is the last time he can win, and Emmys love doing something like this where they award somebody for their last okay. season. Okay. It should be Kieran's if there's an upset, Bob Odenkirk, but this is this is one to watch. All right. How about lead actor in a comedy? Oh, I'm so happy uh, that yeah, we're talking we about this. this. <laughs> I don't uh -huh. know why I do that voice when so I get silly. excited, but uh -huh. it, it comes out. Okay, the nominees are we have Bill Hader for Barry, Jason Siegel for Shrinking, Martin wow, Short for Only Murders so in the Building, oh, okay. Jason Sudeikis for Ted Lasso, and Jeremy Allen White for The Bear. So why do okay. I want to talk about this? Because I think everybody needs to be watching The Bear. Have you seen The Bear yet? I have seen some of okay. it. I need okay. to finish. Uh, and you, you he, won, he won the other one. He won, yeah. he won the Globe. Globe. This is a phenomenal show. Jeremy's going to take it. So if you're okay. not you seem so sure. I'm sure of it. He's going to take it. So if, if you're not familiar with the show, he plays a, an award-winning chef. He comes home to Chicago to take over his brother's sandwich shop after yes. his brother passes, and there's a catastrophe every single day. It is some of the best TV I've seen in a really long time, wow. and everybody's talking about oh. Jeremy because of that Calvin He's Klein coming on ad. Of course. Of you know? Course. Oh, but there, there, there it is. That there it is. <laughs> that is there it is. There. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Do you remember, though, that you said that Hollywood likes someone who is ending their series? Yes. Jason Sudeik? Oh, I know. I know. I love I love Jason Sudeikis, I do, but you also have to keep in mind the timing because uh, we're talking about last year. Yeah, 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 gotcha, so you gotcha. You have to okay. think about the, the yeah. mental state that voters. Right. It's like 20 people at home have to remember that too. Yeah. All right, let's do best actress in a drama. Okay, not much to talk about here. I think Succession is going to, Succession's oh. going to have a pretty big sweep. So, again, phenomenal actors okay. up, but Sarah Snook, Succession, she's going to take it. All right. How about a comedy Be series? Okay. So, what would you want to do? Uh, best supporting actress oh, in a drama? Oh, series? drama! Oh, I, I forgot about that. these. Let's, these do, let's do this. And oh, I this think is a good one. this is a very, very exciting category. Oh. Out of the eight nominees, also kudos for you guys to be able to see that for it. Well, no, we're looking right see. here. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so we have got five actresses from the White Lotus out of these eight nominees. Mm, Jennifer Coolidge. Uh, Jennifer God, Coolidge was among on them. Her. So she's favored yes. to win. No, now, here's really? the thing. She's favored to win, but like. You know, there's some people you want to win because of their performance. Yeah. You want that for her. So but just imagine the acceptance speech she's fun. if she oh, takes this award. Yeah, she's fun. Again, like that's good. We'll be talking about that tomorrow. Okay. Can right. we squeeze in comedy, comedy series? series yes, okay, okay. Can. So comedy series. Listen, if we if we pull up the nominees, we take anything from this list. It's just that TV TV is having its golden era right now. The, the TV is so 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 good. Keeping in mind voting, I believe this is Abbott Elementary's to lose. I hope so. I do. I, I, I love really that do. Show. Yeah. If there's an upset. Oh. It, or competition it'll come from the bear maybe ted lasso but again going back to last year i think i i, I feel like this is abbott elementary okay but you know what i like about this award show we don't know we have no clue yeah but that makes it exciting Good. yes you know because it's not like a lock-in for everybody right. like we kind of we get no by, by the Oscars. Content, that's for sure all right yes so well, we love you thank you that we got a lot in <laughs> we'll be back right after this
welcome to today. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, We're just right. getting started, folks. Your question's almost better than mine. <laughs> what can fans expect? Us forgetting lyrics. <laughs> Greg loves to say Friday. There it is. Friday. I want to say thank you thank to you, this Hoda. lovely human being, Chanel Jones, for hanging out with me today. Tomorrow, we've got Jamie Lee Curtis. Plus, Allison Hoker Boss shares a sweet new project with us. We love her. And Chris Appleton has given some lucky ladies some hair makeovers. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William France Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Ducky Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Ducky Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duck Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Ducky Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po'boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase Jr., and his wife, Leah Lange Chase that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Dookie Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china, she wanted linens, she wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. 
post-1865 in the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African-American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy v. Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws, welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace. But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chases when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades, from red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Dookie. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. Gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy, best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We it's are great to enjoying do. everything. Yeah. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie to Chase to, to get, get myself my... some gumbo. When, when the service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. 
And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X according to Professor Psyche williams Porson, The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's. Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzie Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. 
but racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events just four years apart sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken. Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. It's, it's so, so good, good to see, to see it's you. It's been so long. It's been way too long. I've missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so, he, yeah. after a meal here, after yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. 
Executive Chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's in. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, Sylvia so, so used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So, did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh-huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. See how gentle he's putting it in there? Putting the baby to bed. Yep, they'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. I, I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you better pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, Worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to. I'm gonna try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow, that looks perfect. Now, this now is you're worth, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're going person. for. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning, it's moist, crisp. Oh, your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take this piece to go. Oh, I'm gonna pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you. Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I could come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. 
We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and uh, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas, and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ain't here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and uh, Huey P. Newton come through the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course, grits. 
Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward, and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. There are dozens of Chinatowns all across America. With interesting architecture, diverse restaurants, and specialty shops, it's no wonder they're popular with locals and tourists alike. They also provide places for new immigrants and for families to create communities. But with gentrification and all sorts of problems from the pandemic, it's no wonder that all these Chinatowns are rapidly changing. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Okay, so it's no surprise. There's incredible food to be found here in Manhattan's Chinatown, folks lining up all the time. But there used to be Chinatowns in cities and towns, big and small, all across this country. In fact, the longest running family-owned Chinese restaurant is in a place you might never think of, Butte, Montana. At the turn of the century, Butte, Montana was a bustling mining town. The invention of electricity leading to a demand for conductors like copper. Mining boomed, the city flourishing. The demand for labor brought thousands of immigrants to Butte. They came from so many different countries, including Italy, Ireland, and China. It was the classic portrait of the American West, with gambling, saloons, even a red light district. By 1914, Butte's Chinatown was thriving with over 60 Chinese-owned businesses. Now we're going to prepare broccoli beef. My name is Jerry Tam, and I'm the owner of the Pekin Noodle Parlor. The Pekin first opened as a tobacco shop and casino run by Jerry's great uncle, Hum Yao. Two years later, Hum adding a restaurant, and the Pekin Noodle Parlor was born. Well, this building has three different levels. The top level, obviously, is the Pekin Noodle Parlor. And then the second level on the main street used to be a herbal medicine shop. That shop was run by Jerry's great-grandfather, Tam Kuang Yi. It's crazy to think that, you know, everything came over from China at one time. Like, they didn't make soy sauce in America. The noodles were fried and brought over on ships because they didn't make fresh noodles. So the history of this place really holds true that this is a Chinese restaurant, you know, from Chinese immigrants. I met up with culinary historian Grace Young to learn more about America's earliest Chinatown. Where was the first Chinatown and how did it get started? The first Chinatown is San Francisco. The first Chinese came to California uh, for the gold rush and that was 1848. And uh, they came because America needed cheap labor. And so from gold rush, they ended up doing farming, mm -hmm. manufacturing, and then eventually they worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. And the first Chinatown formed because America wanted cheap labor, but they didn't want the Chinese to live with whites. So they were ostracized from white communities. 
So t talk to me about that first wave of, of Chinese immigration to the U.S. The Chinese came from southern China, from principally from the area of Canton, and there was tremendous prejudice against mm -hmm. the Chinese. They were lynched, and because the Chinese were willing to work for lower wages, they were seen as the reason why Americans were suffering so much. So the blame mm -hmm. was unfairly placed on the Chinese. In 1882, Congress signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law. It banned Chinese from migrating to the U.S. It marks the only time in American history that an entire race or ethnic group was banned from immigrating. But the interesting thing about this Exclusion Act was that there was actually exemption for Chinese tourists, students, teachers, and also merchants. A landmark court case in 1915 classified Chinese restaurant owners as merchants. And it gave them a way to circumvent the Exclusion Act of 1882. It was this exemption that allowed Jerry's great uncle to open Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, paving a path for more family members to immigrate to the U.S. and help the business. Jerry's father, Danny Wong, arrived in the U.S. in 1947 as a teenager. Ever since he was 14 years old, he's been working at the Pekin Noodle Parlor, and he just started with the simple roles of washing dishes, and then he learned how to cook, and then he slowly just started integrating himself into, you know, managing it and working with the waitresses and the staff. Danny taking over the restaurant in the 1950s, spending years turning it into a pillar of the local community. Well, I've been coming here for at least 50 years, and you give me plenty of food, I never walk away hungry. I love coming to work because of all the people I work with. Like, they choose really nice people, and... I mean, my father probably employed over 10,000 people at this, you know, throughout his whole entire life. So it's interesting to know that there's nearly five to six generations of people that, you know, have worked here. The menu at Pekin Noodle Parlor hasn't changed much over the years. We do a thing called chop suey. And what chop suey is, is tidbits of leftover uh, vegetables that were kind of mixed together in its own gravy and served on top of chow mein noodles. We've been serving it for over 110 years. Chop suey is in large part why Chinese food became so popular across the United States. Chop suey was the first time America experienced a culinary craze, a food craze. Mm -hmm. And it's starting at the end of the 19th century that there are Americans who are venturing into Chinatown. The way they got them to even experiment with Chinese food was to make a stir fry that was actually quite bland. Mm -hmm. So they used bamboo shoots, water chestnuts, onions, uh, oftentimes there was celery. For many years, Chinatowns were the only places where non-Chinese Americans could sample Asian flavors. Americans were going into Chinatown, some were curious, they wanted to experience curio shops, Chinese operas. With increased tourism, Chinatowns and large cities grew. But it was a different story in Montana. Like many mining towns, Butte lost many of its workers as production slowed in the 1950s. Once the copper ran dry, then the people just started to pick up and just kind of move on, move on and move back to their families and the bigger states. As miners left Butte for new opportunities, its Chinatown disappeared. In the early 1900s, there were seven chop suey restaurants listed in the Butte City Directory. Today, only the Pekin Noodle Parlor remains open.
Jerry Tam runs the Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, Montana. People may know this is the oldest Chinese restaurant in America, but below it is so much history. Despite Pekin's historic status, Jerry says he was never pressured by family to join the business. I never learned to cook until I came back, uh, back in around 2009, because like any Asian American, my parents wanted all of their kids to go to college, so we all went to colleges around the nation and to get a better education, to become a lawyer, a doctor, and what have you. But I went into fashion, and what was great about that is I got to see the world because of it. In 2004, Jerry even appearing on Bravo's Project Runway. But a few years later, family duty calling him home. And unfortunately, my mom had a stroke, so my dad needed help, you know, taking care of her and take care of the restaurant. I think it was really hard on my father because they were in a generation where they loved each other every day. And they were just best friends. After Jerry's mom passed, Jerry and his dad began operating Pekin together. He never stopped working, so he was working here all the way until 85, until he couldn't make up the stairs anymore. My father and I spent every day together. I made sure he was, uh, he was healthy all the way till the end, the best of my ability I can do. My, my father passed in November, and it was really, you know, heartbreaking. He didn't want to say goodbye to my sisters or me or this restaurant or the community. He loved View Montana. Jerry now runs Pekin Noodle Parlor with his cousin, Nelson. Together, they're working to preserve a family legacy and keep a piece of Chinese American history alive in an unlikely place. I've been asked the question, what is the future of the Pekin? And the best answer I can give you is, let's just keep it the same. Let's not change anything, because that's what people come here for. They have their parking spots, they have their booths, they have their favorite place to sit at the bar. I don't think they want any change, because this is a place that feels like home. While New York City is home to America's largest Chinatown, the honor of the oldest goes to San Francisco. And that's where the Far East Cafe is located. It is one of the last remaining historic Chinese banquet halls. After a two year hiatus, this celebrated venue hosted the 64th annual Miss Chinatown USA pageant, a Lunar New Year tradition. The occasion marking a triumphant milestone 
for this century-old institution. Bill Lee has owned the Far East Cafe since 1999. His daughter Kathy, working by his side as the manager. He brought me into the restaurant to kind of understand the roots of our culture. He wanted me to remember that, you know, Chinatown is about community, is about traditions, is about culture. For many in the community, Chinese banquet halls are more than just venues for special events. I feel that Far East is kind of like a second home for, you know, a lot of our patrons that come in because they feel so comfortable. So much history and so many memories, you know. A lot of patrons that have been here, they've told me, they're like, oh, my parents had my red egg ginger party. It's very similar to like a baptism. And that was like 50 something years ago. And that history is everywhere you look at Far East. The ceilings, the, like my dad mentioned, the high ceilings, the moldings, the moldings are all original. And the lanterns were all imported from China uh, in the 1920s. So they're over 100 plus years old. For the last few decades, there were five giant banquet-style restaurants in San Francisco's Chinatown. But with rising rents and gentrification, most have since closed their doors. By early 2020, only two banquet halls remained. The Far East Cafe planned to celebrate its 100-year anniversary with a big celebration. Instead, it's now planning to close its doors. At the start of the pandemic, the restaurant stayed afloat by cooking meals for senior citizens and low-income residents in Chinatown. We applied for a PPP loan and we got over $200,000. We also received money from the feed and fuel program. Then our landlord gave us six months of free rent. Beyond COVID, a different type of virus brought more harm to Chinatowns across the country. Anti-Asian hate crimes soaring by nearly 340% in 2021. When this started happening, I felt very, very sad and also very angry because I'm like, why is this happening to Chinatown? Why is it happening to our community? You know, for these people to target elderly people, to push them down, to rob them, don't they realize that they have grandparents too, or they have parents that are that age. And if that happened to their parents, how would they feel? People saw the attacks when they watched the news and heard reports, and they got even more scared. They don't want to go out, even for special events like the Mid-Autumn Festival. We tried to invite them, but they didn't want to come. We used to be open until 10 o'clock before pandemic. Sometimes we would stay out here until midnight if we had events. Now, we can't, we can't do that we changed the business hours to close at 7, 7.30, because safety is the most important thing. Business owners across Chinatown still face hostility. George and Cindy Chen opened China Live in 2017. We've been lucky. Uh, we've only had a couple instances where, you know, people scream uh, anti-Asian slurs. And we're concerned about our employees, you know, coming to work and and being harassed. I, I think that ignorance is uh, very unfortunate. China Live is a massive marketplace with multiple restaurants. It's in a building that once housed a banquet hall like Far East. I remember coming to a wedding here when I was in college. And there were, I, think, I think literally 5,000 people in like six restaurants. But unfortunately, you know, real estate was getting very expensive. So it's not very cost effective if you don't have that business. But two years ago, the couple had to lay off 200 workers. However, with the support of partners, George and Cindy were able to pivot their business on a few fronts. We did, you know, the ghost kitchen was selling outside our box. So we have 10 locations in the Bay Area, from San Jose to Berkeley, and, uh, and they can order food from those ghost kitchens. Ghost kitchens prepare restaurant quality food exclusively for delivery or takeout. We sold so many Peking ducks, we didn't know what to do with all the duck fat. So what do you do? You make popcorn with it. So that's why we have a duck fat popcorn. As business picked up, China Live was able to rehire 100 workers. Despite an uncertain future, 
these restaurants remain hopeful that business will rebound. There's more police presence. People are more, as a community, standing up for ourselves, making sure that we have like the buddy system, making sure that we're together and we feel safe, that we're walking together, that we have each other's back. I mean, dining out is an essential part of life, right? I mean, one more fun is to look forward to having dinner with friends you haven't seen at a new place or a old favorite place. But some old favorites just can't be replaced. During the pandemic, many restaurants have shut down. Far East is now the biggest restaurant in Chinatown. If Far East closes, there won't be space big enough to host large events for the community. We were overjoyed having that Miss Chinatown USA event here, a press conference, and just being able to reconnect with the community. It warmed my heart. And my dad was just like so overjoyed that people were coming in just to celebrate. To learn more about the future of Chinese American restaurants, I went to visit Chef Lucas Sin in New York City. This savvy chef is on a mission to save mom and pop shops from closing and putting a spin on the classics. Hey, nice oh, to meet you. To see you. All right, can't wait to yeah, talk come and in, taste. Come in, come in here, come in here. Lucas was born and raised in Hong Kong. Growing up, he had never heard of dishes like General Tso's chicken. What was your first experience with Chinese American food? Yeah. And did you go, what the heck is this? I was here for summer camp, and uh, on Tuesdays, at 10 o'clock or so, right before bedtime, this van would pull up in the front of the school, um, and you could pick between sesame chicken, general Tso's chicken, orange chicken with broccoli and fried rice or white rice or whatever it was. The first thought was that this is ridiculously delicious, whereas it's been my whole life. And the second thought is that what in the world is the difference between orange chicken and general Tso's chicken and sesame chicken? Why is there so much that I don't understand about this if last time I checked I was Chinese? Lucas actually studied cognitive science at Yale, but he always had a passion for cooking. His summers spent training in award-winning restaurants in Hong Kong and Japan. After graduating in 2015, Lucas opened his first restaurant with Yale classmate Yang Zhao. Junzi Kitchen is a fast casual chain that serves modern Chinese fare. But Lucas remained passionate about the Chinese American cuisine he first tasted as a boy. So, so how did Chinese American food, the food that we have become uh, familiar with, how did that develop? How yeah. did that happen? Now, Chinese takeout is interesting, right, because it's all over the United States. Yeah. So these folks come in, they yeah. Yeah. apprentice in a restaurant, right. they learn those recipes, and they then go move somewhere on else, right? To open their own exactly. restaurant. Exactly. And then their cousins come from Fujian, and then those recipes are passed on. And there's a remarkable similarity to, to, to these dishes. 
Despite the popularity of Chinese American food, many family owned restaurants that once dotted Chinatowns and other urban areas have been closing for years. Opening restaurants is really difficult, and running restaurants is perhaps even more difficult. These moms and dads open these restaurants so that their kids can go to university and become lawyers and doctors and television hosts and whatnot. And now that they're finally able to do that, they don't need to run these restaurants anymore, right? The li suddenly, livelihoods have changed. That's a good thing. Lucas and Young hatched an idea to help smaller businesses in 2019. Nice Day seeks out restaurants facing closure, then works with the owners to remodel the space and update the menus. The pandemic stalled the team's initial plans, but the second location in Long Island is slated to open this spring. It's important to me that these new Chinese American takeout restaurants that we're building called Nice Day work with the previous generation of owners because they have a lot of knowledge that mm -hmm. we don't. They know their customers, they know what sells, um, they know how to cook these dishes, they have recipes. You raise an interesting point, Lucas, mm -hmm. in that you talk to these retired mm -hmm. Chinese restaurant owners. I is that part of the, the, the sense of trying to memorialize mm -hmm. what could be lost? Now, preserving recipes is part of it. But the other important part is preserving the way business is done. Chinese takeout restaurants are one of the few restaurants in the world that if they're open from, let's say, 11 to 10, the work hours are 11 to 10. They don't have any prep hours. The same cooks that do the walk stir fries are also prepping during the day. It's ridiculously efficient, and it's got to do with the setup and the way that the kitchens are run. But it's also important to us that we give back to this last generation and that we can make sure that owners who want to retire can retire well and that that legacy can be preserved in a new type of American Chinese takeout restaurant. While Nice Day pays homage to popular Chinese American recipes, Lucas has been celebrated for his innovative fusion dishes. In 2021, he was named one of Food and Wine's best new chefs. We serve a Mapo mac and cheese yeah. here, which yeah. is a variation on that dish. It's fusion-y and it's silly and it's just an attempt to do something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it betrays every chef sensibility that I have, but unfortunately it's delicious and it's interesting and it gets people talking. Finally, it's time to eat. Lucas showing me how to make his signature dish. How do we get started? So the mapo mac and cheese, the mac and the cheese elements are rigorously American. Mm -hmm. These are, This is elbow macaroni right. uh, cooked halfway. And this is Velveeta. Um, but the mapo element is going to be in the form of a mapo sauce, if you will. The last two elements that really sort of take this over the edge is um, Chinese sausage. Oh. It, it can function like bacon and some dried shiitake mushrooms that we've rehydrated. So um, to start off with, we're just gonna cut a couple of things. And this tofu, we will then put into the deep fryer. Mm -hmm. This concludes the chopping portion of our program. <laughs> Next, garlic and ginger are cooked till fragrant. Then, spicy bean paste and soybean paste are added to start the sauce. Mushroom broth is added, the mixture brought to a boil so the flavors infuse. Can I give that a try? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's Here we go. So your left hand's on the walk? Yeah. Yes. I can't, I, can't get, I can't get any altitude on this thing. Nothing's coming up. And that's why the pros do it, baby. At this point, everything's smelling quite good. Uh -huh. So the macaroni is going to go in, as well as the soup we just made. Once it's boiling and happy, two slices of the best of the best. Velveeta. Velveeta American cheese. Wait for that Velveeta to melt. Uh -huh. You see that that sauce is already beautifully tied together. We like to play this dish in the Chinese takeout box. Oh, wow. Because it's silly. Why, um, why not? <laughs> it's fun. Boom. Some fried tofu puffs as croutons go over the top. That's a little bit of texture and the homage to the original Mapo tofu. These fresh scallions are actually really important because they cut through the heaviness mm -hmm. of the original dish. Wow. Just a little spice. 
the creaminess, the crunch of the, the tofu. I hope you get, yeah, get a, a little, little bit of the sausage. sausage, yeah. Whoa, you've never had mac and cheese like this. <laughs> Amid a global pandemic, changing family dynamics and anti-Asian racism, Chinatowns across America and the communities that sustain them face a challenging road ahead. Every business that is open right now is still fighting for its life. And I think that the best way to fight the anti-Asian hate is to show our love for the community. Come to Chinatown or your local Asian American Pacific Islander restaurant, store, market, give them your business. We have lost so much during the pandemic and I think it makes us all so much more conscious that we have to protect what we love. Ah, the avocado. From toast topping to sweet treats, even mac and cheese, this tasty green fruit is pretty much everywhere. But did you know the most popular variety, the Haas avocado, was developed right here in Southern California. So I came all the way across the country to find out how farmers and restaurant owners are making sure we're enjoying these for years to come. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We call this right here, the avocado tunnel of love. <laughs> In the past 20 years, believe it or not, avocado consumption has tripled in the United States. Today, the average American eats eight pounds of these babies every year. I'm at Rancho Vasquez, one of the oldest avocado orchards in the country. Here, the Vasquez family grows several different varieties. Let's avocado check it out. Oh, welcome to Rancho Vasquez. Art? Yes, Nice Art. to meet you. How's it going, sir? Damien Vasquez. Damien, nice welcome to see to you range. guys. Army veteran Art Vasquez has turned his love for avocados into a true family obsession. Four generations live together on this scenic ranch. Many of them work in the orchard and help run the business. I've never been to an avocado farm. Wow. So, uh, this will be a lot of fun. You guys going to give me a tour? Absolutely. All right, let's go. Art's grandfather, Refugio Morones, moved to the U.S. from Mexico in the 1920s. He picked avocados and citrus fruit on several farms, but always dreamed of having his own orchard. When Art was seven, the family purchasing their first acre of this ranch. And that's when my grandfather, Refugio, would start teaching me how to take care of the trees. That's when I, I really started loving picking. My brother and I would pick the avocados, take the avocados down to the town, knocking on doors, selling the avocados. Art put his passion for produce on hold to pursue a career in the auto parts industry. In 2002, he was able to buy the entire property, which was destined to be raised for new houses. We've taken it from 250 trees all the way up to 3,750 trees. This is something, a sustainable legacy that I can leave here and teach my children, grandkids, and the family how to work the earth how to grow things organically. Art had also saved a piece of Golden State history. Avocados are native to Mexico, but some of the first avocado trees in the U.S. were planted in L.A. County in the mid-1800s. Henry Dalton, a wealthy trader who owned ranches in California, fell in love with the fruit during trips to Central America. In 1848, Henry planted the first avocado tree in Azusa. So when he moved to Los Angeles and he took over and bought Rancho Azusa, he knew there was fresh water coming from the Azusa Canyon. And so because of having the fresh water source and the awesome soil, he knew avocados would be great here. During a tour of the ranch, I got to see a living part of that history. What makes it special is one of the first planted avocado trees in the Western United States. This puppy is one of a kind. 
just like us, Al. He's one of kind, <laughs> okay. And it's still producing fruit? Still producing fruit. It produces anywhere between 500 to six, 700 pounds of fruit a year. Experts estimate this tree is more than 100 years old. It produces a type of avocado known as the fuerte, in Spanish meaning strong. It was the first avocado variety to thrive in the United States because it can withstand cooler temperatures. But in the 1920s, a new variety emerged in SoCal that would ultimately dominate the world market. A guy by the name of Rudolf Haas, he was actually a postal carrier, but his hobby was growing. So he had an orchard at his house about 20 miles from here, La Habra Heights. The Haas avocado was a total accident. An amateur farmer, Rudolph had purchased some mystery avocado seeds. When the tree matured, he was surprised by the dark, bumpy fruit it produced. And that really took off commercially because it has a thicker skin. So for shipping purposes, and it's an amazing tasting fruit. The Fuerte and many other avocados stay green when mature, but the skin on a Hass turns black when ripe, hiding any bruises. It didn't take off right away among consumers in the U.S. So it took a few marketing campaigns for Americans to embrace this creamy variety of the fruit. This fourth, put a little green in your red, white, and blue. Today, 80% of avocados grown worldwide are Haas. Now here, this is one of the first Haas trees commercially ever planted. You've got two Haas trees right here. Until the 90s, the majority of avocados consumed in the country were grown in California and weren't available year round. But all that changed in 1994. President Clinton made NAFTA the law today, linking the United States to Canada and Mexico in one large trading bloc. When NAFTA passed, avocados from Mexico became available everywhere, and folks could enjoy them anytime. Today, even named avocado toast a top trend of the 2010s. Avocado toast. I'm not sure how this happened, but there came a time in the past 10 years when people began to realize that their lives were not complete without it. Thanks to clever campaigns, new diet trends, and an abundant supply, avocado consumption has boomed in the last two decades, growing into a multi-billion dollar industry. Now, 90% of those avocados come from Mexico. However, this has led to major environmental impacts, like deforestation. Rancho Vasquez wants to combat the negative effects of monoculture farming. As an organic orchard, they follow strict guidelines to help protect the land. How have the trees and what you grow tried to lessen the impact on the environment? We pick the weeds by hand. Are we weedy? Because it's all organic. Yeah. So we don't ever spray any weed killer or anything like that. The deer come and eat all the lower leaves and skirt the trees for us. Ah. And they turn that into natural manure. Now, when it comes to picking, avocados require a gentle touch. So we still do it the same high-tech way they did it 100 years ago. Wow. You and this is my grandfather's pole? pole right here. Really? Yeah, this is one of the old school ones. So you can pick any of these you want. Okay. So yeah, you just slide it right up till the avocado goes in the basket, and then you pull on the rope. There you go, you're almost there. Pretty different, you're doing pretty darn yeah. good, you know? A little bit further, and then pull the rope. There you there go, you is. got it. <laughs> good job. He's <laughs> easy a catch. Ta-da! There you go, My that's first a nice avocado. one too. It's gonna take a week to a week and a half right now to ripen and let it get soft. How about going and tasting some? Yes, sir. We picked some about a week or so, so they'd be perfect for you. All right, let's do it.
Believe it or not, there are more than 400 varieties of avocados. Rancho Vasquez in Azusa, California sells six. The Fuerte, Hass, Lamb Hass, Reed, Pinkerton, and Gem. Each has a different shape, taste, and growing season. I've never seen such a like a round avocado. The ranch's avocados are prized by chefs and customers for their high oil content. That comes from the area's climate, nutrient-rich mountain soil, and secret farming techniques that have been passed down for generations. The higher the oil content, the better the tasting fruit is. Mm. And then the longer it'll stay green. You can taste and see the difference with their organic hash. It just keeps it really fresh. You can literally fresh. see the oil coming out of it. Yeah. So if you want to try just a little chunk, we'll give you a little chunk. Oh, that's great. Next up, the family favorite, Fuerte. Oh, a real, really a different flavor. Absolutely, absolutely. There's almost, it's almost like a saltiness and a creaminess in there. Aside from his wife's guac, Art's favorite way to eat avos is actually with honey. Ooh. It's called avocado dulce. It's avocado candy. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's fantastic. Isn't it great? I would have never thought of that. Guys, this is just amazing. What does it mean for both of you to, to be owners of this, of this legacy? This is a legacy I do want to leave. My family, my grandkids, Damien, and this will be around for, I'm hoping and praying, for at least another 100 years, you know? And what does it mean for you, Damien? Oh, it's like you said, just a place where history can keep going. Because the trees were here before us, and they're gonna be here after us, so we're just kind of stewards of the land in the meantime. Let's share a little of this guacamole. Yes, sir. Yep. Let the chips fall where they may, as long as they've got guacamole on them. Avila's El Ranchito is a Southern California staple that's been in business for more than half a century. They've got 13 locations and counting of this family-run chain, but no two restaurants are exactly the same. Every Avila's owner puts their own spin on the family's traditional Mexican recipes. But here at the Seal Beach Outpost, they claim to have the best guacamole. So I've come to learn their secrets. It's time to guac and roll. Hey there, wow, got a lot of folks here. The aunts, uncles, siblings, and cousins behind Avalas El Ranchito really treat their guests like family. This location is run by Elise Avalas Smith, a third-generation restaurateur. 
She credits the family's success to her grandma Margarita's hospitality. You know, she just focused on really what we focus on, good, fresh food. Salvador and Margarita, or Mama Avila, immigrated from Mexico to the U.S. in 1958. How did they get into the restaurant business? My father had an opportunity to buy a restaurant and talked to my mother and decided, you know, this is a great opportunity. Salvador using his life savings to purchase the old restaurant property in Huntington Park. He turned to his six kids, including Elisa's dad, Victor, for support. We would go after school and help them do whatever needed to be done. And my father was pretty much during the day taking care of the whole restaurant, and my mother was in the kitchen. So she was in the only one in the kitchen. And then, Grandpa Polder was well, washing yeah. dishes. Mama's traditional recipes have been passed down through many generations. They've come from way, way back in Mexico. When it first opened in 1966, Avila's was the only Mexican restaurant in the mostly white neighborhood. Many customers had no interest in Mama's traditional dishes, so she developed a strategy to draw people in. It seemed like natural for my mother to offer the people whatever they wanted, so mm. it was more like a home. If they didn't have it on the menu, then my mother would go in the kitchen and make it anyway. Over the next three decades, the Avila siblings opened six new restaurants in Southern California. This expansion wasn't a coincidence. Americans at the same time were falling in love with Mexican food. In the early 80s, there were an estimated 2,500 Mexican restaurants in the U.S. Today, there are more than 60,000. I was busting tables here as a child. <laughs> Elise witnessed that growth as a kid, watching her dad expand the family business. So I grew up doing homework in a booth. On top of that, I grew up with my grandparents living one street over from me. So I grew up cooking with her for years and years. After college, Elise tried working in other fields, but she was always drawn back to the restaurants. I'd be working by day, you know, I worked for a magazine. And then my brother opened his first restaurant and I ended up serving tables at night. So no matter what I did, I kept ending up back in this business and I loved it. I realized that this was my passion, it's in my blood. How do you qualify to open up a, an Avila? Well, it's process, let me tell you. <laughs> Is it really? I had to work every position in the restaurant. So I washed dishes, I worked in the kitchen for a few years, but I've done it all. After proving herself for a decade, Elise opened her own Avila's in 2015. When I first opened my restaurant, I worked for several months from about six in the morning till midnight. And finally, I remember my dad and my brother came in for an intervention and said, you need to go home. You gotta sleep. <laughs> you gotta sleep. <laughs> so I went home and they ran my restaurant for the night. And I knew with my dad and my brother here, there was nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. Every Avila's restaurant is unique, reflecting the family member who owns it and the location. They have different decor and specialty menu items. Elise puts her own spin on the brand by offering an extensive tequila cocktail menu. Dad, I'm gonna make you a drink right now. Make it strong. <laughs> Salud, mija. Mm. But there are several dishes you're gonna find at every location. Avocados are crucial to many of the family recipes, including the signature guacamole and their beloved chicken soup. Tell me right. about Mama Avila's soup. That soup that feels like home to me, but it is a chicken breast and rice soup. We make it from scratch every morning, including the broth. We put fresh avocado, cilantro, onion, and tomato in it. And people go, and the first thing they do when they get off the plane is go to have some chicken soup. You mentioned avocado goes into the soup. Tell me about the importance of avocado. It's part of our culture. Bottom line is nobody wants to eat Mexican food without avocado and some guacamole. <laughs> so I'm curious, first you, Victor, what's the secret to a good guacamole? You have to make it, you know, almost really as on a daily basis, almost an hourly basis. It needs to be fresh. It needs to be well seasoned. And a little bit of love. I like to think I make a good guac, but I, <laughs> I'm sure I can learn from the best. So how about showing me how you guys do guac? Before making some guac, I enjoyed a cucumber margarita and got a taste of Mama's famous soup. That's great. I would never think about avocado in chicken soup. Oh my God. I can't take credit for that one, Al. That's all grandma. <laughs> all right, you ready to make some guacamole? You bet. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna dump some fresh garlic in here. Okay. This is a traditional mocha hete. From there, you're gonna sprinkle a little bit of salt just on top. Just a little bit of salt. Just a little bit of love. And then you're gonna use the 
top to go ahead and grind it in there. A mocajete, a Mexican mortar and pestle, is made from volcanic rock. And it's the family secret to great guac. The rough surfaces help crush the ingredients, releasing their natural oils better than chopping them up with a knife. And we're gonna get in some fresh avocado. All right. And then you go ahead and mix that together. Now you gotta be gentle with the oh, avocado soft. With, with some love. Gentle, gentle. In go diced onions, lots of cilantro, and a good squeeze of lime juice. Keep on mixing there, and you got yourself some good, fresh guacamole. I'm gonna dig in here with you too, Al. Mm. Oh, yeah. You make good guacamole, Al. <laughs> I've learned from the best. Elise, to be part of something like this, what, what does it mean? Honestly, I feel compelled to keep these beautiful recipes that are from, gosh, my great-great-grandparents running so that everyone that comes to our restaurant is able to taste them and to sit at our table and feel like family and just be a part of ours. Cheers. How does a ceviche bar a little different from a, a sushi bar? It's like a sushi bar, but more Mexican. Uh huh. <laughs> this lively food court is home to several family owned hidden gems. In fact, here you'll find Holbush, a modern eatery renowned for its sustainable seafood. The chef behind this vibrant menu pairs flavors from his childhood in Mexico with the freshest of California fare. Gilberto Satina never thought he would dedicate his life to cooking. But his summers spent on the Yucatan Peninsula would later inspire a bold move. Since I was a teenager, growing up in the coastal region, I would go diving with my cousins. We would dive down for octopus, uh, we'd get lobsters, we'd get sea snails. And then he would take that back and cook it. And that was one of the first times that I felt a direct connection to food because even back then, there was a disconnect, you right. know? Food came from the supermarket. And it was the first time I saw something that was like directly from the sea and you can cook it and eat it right away. So that kind of blew my mind. Gilberto immigrated to the U.S. when he was five years old. His father, Gilberto Sr., a former civil engineer, worked various restaurant jobs to support the family. How did your family transition from that kind of grassroots sort of food service to right. a real formal restaurant? It, it really was through the help of the nonprofit that, you know, operates Mercado La Paloma. This bustling market is run by Esperanza, or Hope, a nonprofit dedicated to revitalizing South Los Angeles and helping first-time business owners. They gave us small business training, basic you know, restaurant health department training. They co-signed loans so my dad could purchase the equipment. It was my dad's dream to have a restaurant that represented our Mexican food, the food of the Yucatan, which is very distinct from other regions of Mexico. In 2001, Gilberto Sr. opened the family's first restaurant, Chichen Itza. The menu featuring traditional dishes like conchinita pibil, salbutes, and panuchos. Lo empezamos la mamá de Gilberto y yo, o sea, mi esposa y yo. 
En, al principio éramos dos personas nada más. They needed help, but Gilberto was reluctant to join the family business. I didn't want to cook. I didn't want to be in the kitchen because I, I grew up in a household where we always, you know, cooking was always used to make ends meet, like a lot of, you know, immigrant families. So when we opened the restaurant and my dad asked me to come along and help him out for six months, I was front of the house. Slowly I just discovered the cooking and that I enjoyed it and, you know, started learning from my dad. Even without formal training, Gilberto quickly learning the ropes, becoming a savvy businessman. Ten years in, Chichen Itza was thriving with dozens of employees. They even released a cookbook. Con el paso de los años, finalmente empezó a sentir la misma pasión que yo tenía por el negocio. After taking over at Chichen Itza, Gilberto was ready for a new challenge, one inspired by those summer boat trips in Mexico. Where does the name Holbosch come from? So Holbosch is a place. It's an island off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. He wanted to bring tropical, fresh from the sea vibes, along with an elevated experience, to diners in South Los Angeles. When Holbosch opened in the same market, it changed many perceptions of what Mexican food could be. We go outside of the realm of Yucatan and we do food from all different coastal regions of Mexico. Gilberto's fusion dishes allow the freshest fish to shine. Menu staples include seasonal ceviches and an octopus taco. His innovative cooking has wowed locals and critics alike. How does it feel to be nominated for a James Beard Award for this? Mm. After the shock, I think the first thing that I felt was extreme pride in my team. To a certain level, I guess it feels a little bit like validation because we're doing something slightly outside of the box. You look across Mexican cuisine and, and one of the commonalities is the avocado. Why does the avocado work so well across cuisines in Mexico, but especially your cuisine? The pairing of avocado goes extremely well with raw seafood preparations like ceviches and cocteles, and they're very bright, light, and acidic. I think avocado is the perfect complement because it gives it a little bit, you know, creamy richness. That delicate balance is best represented in the shrimp and scallop aguachiles. And I couldn't wait to try making it. So agua chile is super simple. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take, we're gonna make a marinade that's gonna cook or denature our scallops, right? So we're just gonna take some, some cilantro. Uh -huh. Next up, the chili. Serrano peppers bring the heat. Persian cucumbers cool it down. There's a pinch of salt, ice to prevent oxidation, and a squeeze of lime juice. Then the marinade blends for just about a minute. Now, we're just gonna take a bowl. Go ahead and put a couple of uh, spoonfuls of these beautiful Baja California Bay scallops. Ooh, look at those. Now, we're gonna pour the marinade and hold on to the spoon for stirring. Perfect, that's about right. We wanna let that marinate for at least five minutes. Gilberto takes his agua chile to the next level with an avocado rose. After pitting and peeling, it was time to get slicing. Your knife can be straight because your avocado is at an angle, and we're pull oh. cutting. You're just gonna do this, Al. Look. Okay. The key to a great rose? Super thin slices. We're hiring, you know. <laughs> okay. Now the next step. Hands, right? This we're gonna do this this motion. We're gonna fan out the okay. avocado, right? Okay. So you see that? Oh wow. Go. Looking good there. I think that's uh, good enough to roll. You're gonna start at the tip right here, okay. and you just roll this one like that. You see how that's forming a really big flower? Yes. This is a pretty advanced skill, yeah. but I think it's one worth practicing. Oh yeah. And it's a nice party trick, you know? Sure. Impress your friends. Yeah. So, which one should we use? <laughs> that one. Made by the professional. Time to plate it up. That's looking beautiful. You're a lot neater doing this than I am. I'll yeah. take like a spoonful of them and just yeah. drop it on there and then arrange them on the plate. Ah, pro tip. And of course, the finishing touches. Wow. This is our scallop aguachile. And I help make it. Can something this pretty taste as good as it looks? Mm. 
Now we'll go to Dubai. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But yet so simple. Thank you, sir. Oh, it was a pleasure. Fantastic. The Haas Avocado may have started out as a lucky surprise, but for decades, its popularity has been no accident. The Mexican-American culinary traditions passed down through the years have made this delicious and nutritious fruit a staple for so many of us across the country. And thanks to generations of enterprising families, this bumpy green fruit is going to have a very long shelf life. New York City is home to so many iconic foods. But when the city that never sleeps wakes up for breakfast, they want a bagel with a cream cheese schmear piled high with locks. There's no other city that makes a bagel like a New York City bagel. I have not had good bagels in any other city. I came out the wounds eating bagels. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. If New York's known for anything, it's its bagels. And we got them all. Everything bagels, rainbow bagels, pumpkin bagels, croissant bagels, and of course you can't have them without a schmear. While the bagel first came from Poland, many food historians say its pairing with salmon and cream cheese originated right here in the Big Apple. In this town, few specialty food shops are as beloved and as historic as Russ and Daughters. I've been waiting in line probably 15, 20 minutes, but it's definitely worth it. I like the, the contrast of the flavor. It's like a nice little bagel with a with salty locks. Something about the salmon and cream cheese together. Like I try to make it at home, but it's nothing compared to Russ and Daughters. They've been serving premium smoked fish to hungry New Yorkers and folks from around the world for over 100 years. Just a few blocks from the store is the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Hi, Al. Hey, how are you? Welcome to the Russell Daughters Cafe. Nice to see it's you. Great guys. to have you here. Thanks for having us. This is beautiful. Thank you. Nikki Russ Betterman and Josh Russ Tupper are the grandchildren of the original daughters. These cousins are fourth generation owners carrying on their family's culinary legacy. So, this is Russ and Daughters. Wow. This is our great grandfather, Joel Russ, who started the business his wife, Bella, and his three daughters. Um, we, Josh and I have the same grandmother, and she was the youngest of the three. Was it unusual at that time for you, because you usually would see so-and-so and sons, yeah. but to see Russ and daughters. Very unusual. But I mean, honestly, if he'd had sons, it probably would have been Russ and sons. Well, thank <laughs> like, goodness he did. We like exactly. to think of him as a feminist, but he was a good businessman. Joel Russ immigrated from Poland in 1907. And he started just standing on the streets of the Lower East Side selling schmaltz herring out of a barrel. And a family could feed itself for two nights with one fish. In 1914, he opened his first brick and mortar shop, J. Russ National Appetizing. Joel and his wife had three daughters, Hattie, Ida, and Ann. When they turned 11, each daughter began working with their dad. What was their relationship like with him? I, because uh, he's your dad, but he's also your boss. your boss. Yeah, and I think he cared more about being the boss and the shopkeeper. He was a new immigrant to this country who was just trying to survive and make a place for his family. And that was his focus. And he saw his children as, as you know, cheap labor. The sisters grew up learning all aspects of the business. In 1935, Hattie, Ida, and Ann became Joel's partners. The shop was renamed Russ and Daughters, making it the first in America to bear and daughters in its title. When your great-grandfather decided to, to start Russ and Daughters, why the Lower East Side? After Ellis Island, this was the starting off point for the majority of poor Jewish immigrants. This is where they landed and they got their start. And so he was just feeding basic food to other poor immigrants like himself. 
At the turn of the century, this neighborhood was one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Many immigrants from all around the world lived in overcrowded tenement buildings, the conditions having a profound impact on their diets. One of the things about Lower East Side Jewish food is that a lot of food wasn't made at home. When you don't have running water or when you don't have uh, electric or gas stoves, it's really hard to do very much cooking. And so for, for women who are responsible for feeding their families, they had to get food from push carts, from restaurants, from bakeries. Joel Russ was one of many vendors catering to this new population. I've, I've always been curious, how did it come about, or from what you've heard, that somebody thought, hey, you know, here's this round bread, we'll put some fish on it, but oh, by the way, before we do, let's put some cream cheese, some dairy on it. Yeah. First of all, Russ and Daughters is the torchbearer of what's called appetizing. And this is a food tradition born here in New York, and it's the sister food tradition to delicatessen, both of which come up through the Jewish kosher dietary rules. You have to separate fish and dairy from meat. So a delicatessen, strictly speaking, is for meat. The appetizing store is where you go for fish and dairy, things like herring, smoked fish. When we say bagel and lox, most people are, you know, we're referring to a smoked salmon, but sure. the original bagel and lox was not with smoked salmon. Technically, lox, or belly lox, is salmon cured in salt, which preserves fish without refrigeration. There's no smoking involved, and it's incredibly salty, so it pairs perfectly with tangy cream cheese. But who was the first person to put lox on a bagel? So no one really knows how bagels, lox, and cream cheese all came together. We know that bagels come from Eastern Europe. We know that lox kind of comes basically from Nova Scotia, kind of. We know that cream cheese is an American food. But what we know is that these things come together as part of a compromise between different generations of American Jews. Jewish law prohibits cooking with most heat sources on the Sabbath. So the combo of bagels and lox created a filling meal for observant Jews to enjoy on the day of rest. It's good for a family, but you or your daughter-in-law didn't have to be spending the, the previous day cooking. As one of the country's oldest appetizing stores, Russ and Daughters has been serving kosher meals for generations. And the weekends are still their busiest days. I can't think really of th anything that's more New York than lox and bagels. I agree. I think that this is a food that came up through the Eastern European Jewish immigrants to New York. But now it's it transformed and just become New York food. It belongs to all New Yorkers. In the United States, women own less than 20% of all businesses. 
At the iconic Russ and Daughters, co-owner Nikki Russ Betterman is building on the legacy of her grandmother and great aunts. Growing up, you, you follow in the footsteps of, of strong women who may not have chosen this, but took it on and obviously made it really successful. What is it like for you following in those footsteps? It's a tremendous feeling to be now the and great-granddaughter. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a good customer of ours. Her family came from the Lower East Side. And she once said that before she knew the word feminist, when she looked up at the sign, Russ and Daughter, she understood that women could have an impact. Your family's business, Russ and Daughter, has survived two world wars, a depression. You're here in the shadow of the World Trade Center. Yes. Why has this place been able to not just survive, but thrive? I think because in each generation there has been someone who wanted to do this. This is food that people turn to for comfort in hard times. And during the pandemic, we saw that, you know, people were shipping Russ and Daughters all over the country to their loved ones because they couldn't be together. And so sending, you know, bagels and locks and babka, say, you know, I love you, I miss you. Here, let me feed you. Having a schmear over Zoom. Oh, there was a lot of that. <laughs> okay, so you can get smoked fish pretty much everywhere these days but not quite like this. The salmon sold at Russ and Daughters is prized for its high fat content, from the milder Gaspe Nova to the smokier Scottish. And this gourmet fish is all sliced by hand. When you hold it up, I mean, it's it's almost translucent. That. Yeah, I think we should show you how we get at that then. Yeah, me and a sharp utensil, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> It takes up to six months of training to master the slicing technique here. So Al, I hear you have some knife skills. Well, I've been in a fight or two, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, probably nothing like yours. So how, how long have you been slicing salmon? I've been at the store for 20 years. Wow. Um, so I've been slicing for a while. All right, so, so uh, I watch people slice and I, uh, I'm amazed at, at how patient, because it seems like that's part of the, the skill. The reality is when you know how to slice, mm -hmm. it is one of the most relaxing things you can do. Very zen. Very zen. Ooh. Meditative, right? Mm. The trick is don't look anywhere on the fish. You have to really feel the fish. Be the fish. Be the fish, which is a very difficult concept to train yeah, someone. Good. Um, and particularly the first couple slices mm. are, don't be upset okay. if they don't look great. The idea is to make a consistently thick slice. You making so, faces at me? No, I'm just watching you not watch the fish. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Be the fish. Not looking. You should you should look. I should you look. You got a sharp knife in your hand, Al. And you can see that as you change the angle of the knife, it changes the thickness. Yeah. Right? So now that's Drastically, a very Drastically, more than a, you think. That's more than, oh my gosh, that's a very thick we call slice. call those chuletas. Chuletas? Yeah. Chops. Ah. In Spanish. I was going to say, that sound, that, that didn't sound <laughs> Yiddish. Not, not that Yiddish. did not sound not Yiddish, Yiddish to me. Yeah. Does the way you cut it affect the taste of it or the texture of it? The texture, which uh, affects the experience of the salmon. It's almost like you're eating the essence of salmon, not salmon. It's very delicate. It's a very appealing mm -hmm. texture and, and mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thinner. Josh, thanks so much. Nice meeting you. Such a pleasure to have you. Ah, smoke them if you got them. Up next, how fresh salmon gets turned into locks.
here at the Acme Smoked Fish Factory. Now there is something fishy going on in there and you better believe I'm gonna find out what it is. The folks at Acme process, smoke, and pack nearly eight million pounds of fish every year. They sell to eateries all over the country, including Russ and Daughters. It smells of smoke and it smells of fish. That's the way it's supposed to be. It smells right. like New York City. Yes. All right, so as you know, in any food, food plant, food safety is uh -huh. of paramount importance. Right. I see you got your boots on I here. just happen to be wearing these. Awesome. <laughs> I'll walk you through the process of how salmon turns into smoked salmon. Adam Kaslow is the fourth generation owner of Acme Smoked Fish. His great grandfather, Harry Brownstein, started selling fish after immigrating from Russia to Brooklyn. Wow. Harry started in the smoked fish business in the early 1900s, in 1906 to be exact. Out of, went, out of a push cart? Out of a, 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 a horse drawn wagon. Wow. He would go around buying fish from different smokehouses throughout Brooklyn and Queens and had himself the sales route. You know, he worked close to 45 years. I mean, his dream was to open up his own smokehouse, and it took him 45 years to finally achieve that. Wow. Adam now runs a massive smoked fish empire, supplying many of New York City's popular bagel shops, from H&H &H to Essa Bagel. Acme also selling to national grocers like Trader Joe's. At the end of the day, uh -huh. it's all about the fish. We bring in fish from all over the world. Uh -huh. Smoked salmon is probably the most popular thing that we make, and our salmon come from different places, Norway, Scotland, Chile, and Alaska. It can take up to five days to make smoked salmon. Every order is made to the buyer's tastes, from the type of salmon to the curing method. The first step, cutting a whole fish into fillets. Whoa! Yeah, so this is a 12 kilo whole salmon Jeez. that I caught over here in Long Island Sound. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is an Atlantic salmon. Uh -huh. It's farm, farm raised. We use Atlantic salmon because it has the, the most fat. And fat equals flavor when making smoked, smoked salmon. Right. So what are you cutting out, the like the backbone there? Yeah, just do the bone. Uh-huh. Carving into a fish this size requires expert hands. After the fish is filleted, it's preserved with salt. The fish is then treated with a wet brine or a dry cure. Okay, so let's dry, dry cure some, some salmon. Good. First thing, we're gonna get it onto the uh, raft. Okay. okay. So. See if you can pick up this salmon, grab it by the by the, the tail. Okay. Grab with your other hand. Underneath. And we're gonna lay it onto this the, the screen. Okay. Perfect. Great. Step two, we're gonna grab a handful of salt. So it's just a thin layer. Yep. Right along the top of the dorsal. Like kind of down the center line, I suppose. And we'll give it a nice love, love tap. That's it? That's it. This fish is rather large. So traditionally, we would probably dry, uh, wet brine uh -huh. this, this fish. But for smaller fish, the, the dry cure lasts about 24 hours. OK. That's a huge fish. Right. After curing, the fillets are cold smoked for up to 20 hours. This process imparts a subtle smoky flavor. Let me show you how the smoker works. So these are a collection of that wood chip blend that we were uh -huh. talking about earlier. There are different ways to smoke fish fillets. Hot smoking results in flaky, opaque fillets. Unlike traditional lox, smoked salmon is cold smoked below 85 degrees. This helps the fish retain its silky texture and makes it perfect for slicing. Ready to help me get this bad boy into the You oven? bet. All right. All right. Hey now. Let's close her up. Woo! 
Shut her down. After the smoker, the fish is cooled, then packed for shipping. What would your great grandfather say if he could see all of this? I think he'd be amazed at how difficult it was for him to achieve his dream. Right. Now his descendants have been able to build upon that dream and build us into one of the preeminent smokers in the U.S. Up next, a vegan deli taking on tradition with plant-based lox and cashew cream cheese? Oh, you don't want to miss this. Side, two sisters, inspired by their Jewish heritage, are on a mission to make the food they loved growing up in a more sustainable way. Ladies, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Boom. you. Want to show me around? Please, come Play, on in. Lead away. Erica and Sarah Kaberski are the co-owners of Orchard Grocer, an entirely vegan market inspired by classic delicatessens. This is our healthy cashew cream cheese. They want to make the vegan lifestyle easier for all. Right after college, they opened their first business, a shoe store called Moo Shoes. We opened our vegan shoe store 20 years ago. How are they? They're comfortable? About five years ago, we decided that we were going to update it by adding our vegan grocer, basically because it seemed like that's what our customers want. Um, after asking us what our shoes were made of, probably where should I go eat was um, the second most common question. So we decided to create an experience where they could just go eat next door. Growing up in Queens, the sisters' Jewish culture and food were closely linked. They had 10 Jewish delis in their neighborhood alone. Probably every Sunday, a tradition in our family, dozen bagels um, at the bagel store. A dozen always meant 15. I don't know <laughs> why that was, but and uh, with the cream cheese and lox, and that was just uh, how we spent our Sundays. Both sisters became vegan as teenagers, but felt they lost a piece of their roots by giving up certain foods. I think our parents were supportive of our changes to the vegan lifestyle. We grew up in a very culturally Jewish household, so all of our traditions were just based around food. Today, a lot of folks are going vegan for a variety of reasons, from reported health benefits to concerns over animal welfare. For the sisters, it's also a matter of global importance. We're watching climate change happen right now, and I think that's causing a lot of people to think twice about what they're eating and how they are contributing. So it makes sense to us that it is becoming so mainstream. In 2017, Sarah and Erica saw not just an opportunity to satisfy a growing market, but to pay homage to their Jewish roots. We wanted to have a, a good sandwich selection that really epitomizes like New York deli food. So obviously a bagel and mox was going to be there. Orchard Grocer sells a variety of vegan sandwiches, including Reuben's and tuna melts. But the sisters are most passionate about serving up a sense of nostalgia. People are so worried about giving things up. So I think just creating those alternatives and 
just something that people are familiar with and gives them that feeling of home. Yeah, like we haven't had to give up our Sunday tradition of um, bagels and lox. To help make their unique deli a reality, the sisters hired vegan chef Nora Vargas. Nora shares a passion for plant-based foods. She also knows how to turn carrots into salty lox. How did you come up? I mean, you have to think, okay, what can mimic uh, mm -hmm. a smoked salmon? Yeah. Uh, so how did you... Was it look like like you yeah. thought, well the only orange vegetable out there <laughs> exactly. other than a sweet potato is carrot. We know the texture that we need to go for. We know the flavor that we want to go for. So we started with the color and then we just kind of built it from there. Okay, so let's get started. I'm let's I'm really fascinated. Okay, by this. all right, I'm excited. So we have prepared. What do we have? Maybe 10 pounds of carrots here wow. for you. These are huge. These would have been huge carrots. Seriously, yeah, like wow. the size of my forearm. But you, <laughs> you have you have sliced them very thin on a mandolin. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. All right. So we're all gloved up, and we are going to the next step in this process is to uh, apply our rub okay. to our carrots. So in here we have a mixture of sugar, salt, and the rest I can't tell you about. Oh, uh, it's a secret exactly. kind of thing. So yeah. this this would be kind of like the brine that you would mm -hmm. use, the dry brine that you would use yes. on fish. Exactly. Except yeah. it's going on vegetables. Yeah. We got our inspiration for a lot of different components of this recipe from the way that you would actually prepare fish if we were preparing fish and not carrots. Right. Coat everything. Hmm, interesting. Oh no, don't smell it. Don't, don't figure out the secret just I'm, by smelling I'm, it. Okay, now. Because if I figure it out, she's gonna have to kill me. <laughs> so I'm just gonna start rubbing, just smushing everything in there. Once we get everything coated, we would let this sit for three to six hours, mm -hmm. probably. Okay, great. So I think we've, I think we nailed it. Okay. In here. It's another secret ingredient? Definitely. Jeez, yeah, a, but I can tell you. A lot you. of secrets here at Orchard. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit. Okay. Okay, so it's a combination of olive oil mm -hmm. and aquafaba. Aquafaba? Yeah, are you familiar with that ingredient? I don't know. You know when you're opening up a can of beans right. and you gotta drain them? Yes. The stuff that you drain out, that's aquafaba. Aquafaba. It's, like, it's bean water. It's bean bean juice. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna pour, okay. and then you can kind of do the same process. Okay, that we same did before. process. Just squish it all in there, okay? Yeah, perfect. After we had let our carrots sit for three to six hours, right. um, we toss them in the oven. So they bake. We like to call it cold smoking just ah. to sound like classy. You like the process of making smoked salmon. Exactly, yeah. That okay. does look very much like smoked salmon. <laughs> and what would a bagel and lox be without the cream cheese? This vegan spread is made with raw cashews, salt, some secret spices, and coconut oil, all blended together with soft tofu. Should we make a bagel? Sure, let's do it. Cheers. Cheers. This is a really terrific idea. Thank I'm, you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That yeah. was fantastic. Like it was a great way to finish things up. I mean, we've, we've seen the history. We've gone to the past. We were in the present. And you have brought us the locks and bagels of the future. <laughs> A bagel with cream cheese and smoked salmon is a uniquely American combination. Born from Jewish roots, transformed by local ingredients, and carried on by new generations, this breakfast tradition has truly stood the test of time when it comes to food in New York City. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, 
and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William France Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Dookie Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Dookie Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duke Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Dookie Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po' boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase, Jr. and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Ducky Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china, she wanted linens, she wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution, years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws, welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace. But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chase's when she gave African-American artists 
the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time, they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life, even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades. From red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Duke. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. In. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. The gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African-American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family. and It's such a joy. And that joy best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hello. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We are enjoying everything. everything. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie to Chase to, to get, get myself some gumbo. When, when the service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. 
This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X according to Professor Psyche williams Forson, The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events, just four years apart, sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open, nothing was open, you know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken.
Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. it's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, my baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's had. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, so we used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. So gently he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep. They'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Ah, yeah. Wow. Like I feel her. I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. You gotta <laughs> pick, up your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow. That looks perfect. Now this now is you're what, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're person. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning, moist, crisp. Oh. Your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this piece to go. Oh, I'm going to pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I can come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and uh, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas, and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here but there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ate here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come through the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. There are dozens of Chinatowns all across America. With interesting architecture, diverse restaurants, and specialty shops, it's no wonder they're popular with locals and tourists alike. They also provide places for new immigrants and for families to create communities 